1989, after 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Kent Hoban began the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism in Pensacola, Florida. In order to combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year, Creation Science offers four great tools to help strengthen the faith of believers and win the loss to Christ. The first tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hoban and his son Eric. For over 12 years, Dr. Hoban has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in nearly every state and over 20 foreign countries. Notice what the textbook says. Boys and girls, 30 million years ago. It means a fairy tale is coming next. 30 million years ago, these primates evolved. There's that word again, evolved. Then it says, they are ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans. Grandpa? Well, big eyes you have, Grandpa. His fast-paced illustrated seminars cover such diverse topics as why the Earth cannot be billions of years old, why Adam lived to be 930, evidence that dinosaurs have always lived with man, lies in public school textbooks, where the races came from, and how evolution influenced the rise of communism, Nazism, and the New World Order. The second tool creation science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoban's seminars have circled the globe and reaped a harvest of souls for the Kingdom of Christ, as well as helped restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda they have been subjected to. These videos are available in English, French, Russian, Spanish, Japanese, and Sign Language. There are videos of live debates and many other topics as well. The third tool we make available is our website. DrDino.com has lots of information from charts and graphs to articles on a host of topics. Thousands visit our site regularly to gain insight into God's creation. Our fourth tool is the new and exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from across America to visit our museum, science center, and theme park where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson for everyone from 4 to 94. To find out how you can schedule a seminar at your church, or for more information on the materials we carry, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503. Or call us toll free in the U.S. at 877-479-3466. Hey mates, this is Ray Dijo right here at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola. Do you love dinosaurs, swings, and adventure? Then Dinosaur Adventureland is the perfect place to have your awesome birthday party. A dinosaur birthday adventure. All birthdays come with rides, tour guides, science center, dinosaur cakes, and goodies for all. Ah, this is the Dinosaur Adventure Place. Come to Dinosaur Adventureland, located 5800 North Palafox. Hey folks, don't forget about our exciting new homeschool science classes offered here from Creation Science Evangelism. We have a class introducing the whole subject of creation science. We have another class called our Introduction to Physical Science. The kids will learn about levers, pulleys, and mechanical advantage, and gravity and inertia. We also have our Introduction to Earth and Space Science, where they will study the marvels of God's amazing creation. Also, our Introduction to Biology and new classes coming all the time. We also have an exciting new series of videotapes from the world famous scientists Dr. Kaboom and Dr. Kabang. You will love watching these wacky scientists teach science in a way you will never forget. Call or write to get information about our homeschool science classes available from Creation Science Evangelism.
welcome to our seminar part five about how the evolution theory has uh, influenced the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism, and the New World Order. Folks, evolution is not just a dumb idea. It's a dangerous philosophy. And I don't leave my gorgeous wife and travel all the time and speak 700 times a year because I like being gone. <laughs> There's a war going on. And I want to help win the war. There's a real battle going on, and some people don't even comprehend what's happening. Now, this, uh, like I said, is not my wife. It's just a picture of her. And we live in Pensacola, Florida. We've been there since 1989. January of 89, we moved to Pensacola, Florida. We have three kids, one of each. They are all married now, and all six of them work in my ministry. So it's a real blessing having everybody right there uh, in the hometown. No grandkids yet. Need to have a long talk with those, those kids. All right. Kip Kinkle said, if there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. Where did a 15-year-old kid get a philosophy like this, anyway? On May 21st, 1998, 15-year-old Kip Kingle, a student at Thurston High School, allegedly entered the school cafeteria, fired more than 50 rounds from a semi-automatic rifle. 26 students were injured, two were killed, Later, the bodies of Kinkle's parents were found in his home. He was then arrested and taken to police headquarters where he attempted to murder a detective during his initial questioning. He was not isolated from other students and got into minor kid-type difficulties every once in a while. However, there was no indication during his, high school, during his school years that he had severe mental or behavioral problems. I've known him who he was since middle school. He was a friendly kid with a quick smile and he was well-liked. He had many friends because he attended the school district for many years. Both of his parents were teachers within the same district, and they were well loved and respected by all the other students and staff. They were not typical, they were the typical all American family who lived in an upscale home in a rural subdivision of lovely homes and spent countless hours with their children. The parents were praised by every neighbor, friend, and fellow employee as devoted to their children. They fully participated in all their children's school activities, took them on cultural trips during vacations, etc. To date, however, there has been no closure about why Kip Kinkle murdered his parents, two students, and shot 26 other schoolmates. Kip said in a poem that he wrote called Love Sucks, he said it's easier to hate than love because there is so much more hate than, and misery in the world than there is love and peace. Some people say that you should love everyone, but that is impossible. Look at our history. It is full of death, depression, rape, wars, and diseases. I also do not believe in love at first sight, but I do believe in hate at first sight. Therefore, love is a much harder feeling to experience. If there was a God, he wouldn't let me feel the way I do. There is no God, only hate. What causes a student to feel this way? What's going on? At Columbine High School, the kids who did the shooting, this article uh, came out in the Rocky Mountain News. They said their clothes may give a clue to the thinking of these teenagers. The autopsy report for one of the killers documents that on the day of the tragedy, he was wearing black combat boots, a black glove on his right hand, and a white t-shirt with the inscription, Natural Selection, on the front. This kid was a real strong believer in evolution. Right after the Columbine shooting, almost instantaneously, five more students from within the Springfield School District were arrested for threatening to murder students, principals, or teachers. In the adjacent school districts, more students were arrested for violent threats. And in one case, an elementary schoolboy shot five of his classmates with a BB gun while they were playing out in the yard. Folks, what's going on? What I want to try to do in this seminar is give you a more clear picture of what kids are being taught, why they believe the way they believe, what's in these textbooks, and how the evolution philosophy is really responsible for a lot of the things we're seeing in our society today. I taught school 15 years, I have a PhD in education. I've now spoken on this topic to about 700 times a year for the last 13 years. This is an active study of mine. I really, really want to help. I go visit prisons all the time. I went and visited the two boys in Arkansas that shot everybody in Arkansas. I sat across the table for two hours and talked to those boys. We, our ministry donates thousands and thousands of dollars worth of materials to prisons and to prisoners. We're putting our money where our mouth is, okay? We would like to help. 
I would like to give you my unbiased opinion of what I think is causing the problem in our society. In our seminar part one, we talked about the Big Bang Theory and the age of the earth. In part two, we explained why the people lived to be 900 years old before the flood came in the days of Noah. What was the Garden of Eden like? Seminar part three, we talked about dinosaurs, where they fit into history. They're part of the normal creation. They were made on the day six along with the rest of the animals. They lived with Adam and Eve in the garden. Noah took them on the ark. Probably babies, of course. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. Uh, after the flood, people killed most of them. They called them dragons. And there could be a few still alive today. On our seminar part four videotape, we talked about lies in the textbooks. Things that kids have to face every day that are simply not true. They're being lied to. I mean, there's no kind way to say it, okay? There are 30 or 40 some basic lies in every single textbook that I have seen. And all of them are designed to get the kids to believe in evolution. Now, in this session, we're going to focus on the last 150 years of history to see what the evolution theory has done to people's thinking process. Let's review some of what we covered on part four, and then we'll discuss racism, communism, Nazism, and the coming New World Order. Coming soon, folks, to a city near you, and then tell you, after we get you all scared when you see what's going on, then we're going to tell you what you should do about it. Okay? God's in charge. Don't get nervous. James Hudson, back in the late 1700s, started the idea in modern society that the earth is billions of years old. And we mentioned in seminar four that this was a time of anti-monarchy, get rid of the king and establish a democracy. The Laodicean age, Revelation chapter three, the rule of the people. Well, James Hudson's book influenced a young lawyer named Sir Charles Lyell, and Charles Lyell wrote this book in 1830. There were a variety of people involved in this. It's hard to pin it on one person, but Charles Lyell certainly has to be one of the key players responsible for bringing us the evolution theory. He's the guy who invented the geologic column, which you kids have to study in school. And the geologic column does not exist in the world except in the textbooks. We covered video number four. We covered all about the geologic column. This fellow says, I myself have little doubt that in England it was the long age uniformitarian geology and the theory of evolution that changed us from a Christian to a pagan nation. And by the way, England today is a pagan nation. And I will quickly say America is also a pagan nation. I don't know if we ever were a Christian nation, but we're not now. And we might as well get used to it, folks. We have to reach them like you reach the pagans, like they did in Acts chapter 17, with the creation message. Charles Darwin who wrote the book Origin of Species, and there's more to the title. We'll cover that in a minute. He was strongly influenced by quite a few folks. He was influenced by Lyle. He was influenced by a guy named Malthus. Now, Malthus had written a book saying, there are more people born than can possibly survive. So it's best if the weaker die off. Well, Darwin read that and believed it and said, wow, well then, okay. That goes along with my theory of evolution. Um, James Hutton's book came out in 1795. Charles Lyell took away the flood, and his book came out in 1830. Darwin's book came out in 1859, and he took away the creator. And boy, for the next 50 years, we saw the rise of all sorts of interesting philosophies. After all, if there is no God, well then, we must be God. And that led immediately to the rise of communism, socialism, Marxism, and the New World Order. Um, Fred Hoyle, a famous British astrophysicist, said, I am haunted by a conviction that the nihilistic, nihilistic philosophy, which so-called educated opinion chose to adopt following the publication of The Origin of Species, committed mankind to a course of automatic self-destruction. A doomsday was then set ticking. Well, Fred, I agree. Most of what we're seeing today really started 150 years ago when people rejected God. See, there are four great questions and two ways to answer them. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? Evolution tries to offer four answers to those four questions. Creation offers an answer to those questions also. See, if creation is true, there are two ways to look at the world. Some people look at it and say, wow, it's an incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creation worldview. Other people say, nope, just evolved all by itself. The Bible says God created the heaven and the earth, but some people are able, are able to look at this world and say with, a honest, with a straight face, you know, there's amazing, it's a big bang, made this from nothing. 
That's the humanist worldview. See, humanists put humans in God's place. They say man is God. Humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. That's the first plank in the humanist manifesto. Hmm. Interesting. Evolution is the foundation for humanism. This fellow wrote a book, and in his book he said, Do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes, that supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. Hmm. This guy says, The turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Now, just who owns this world anyway? People get this idea, I am God, 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 I am God. Hey, Gabriel, come and listen to this. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> We're not such big shots, folks, okay? You're not God, okay? And the job's not even available anyway, okay? See, if evolution is true, then who owns this world? Fundamental question. Who owns the world? Who owns you? Who makes the rules? How do you decide right from wrong anyway? If evolution is true, how are kids supposed to decide right from wrong? They have no moral standard, no moral compass to go by. If man is God, and this is what a humanism means, then the strongest make the rules. Might makes right. That's a natural philosophy that flows from evolution. There is no absolute standard, and there's no possible way to tell right from wrong. During the Civil War, one man decided he did not want to get involved on either side. So he put on a Yankee coat and rebel pants. I said, now they'll both leave me alone. Well, after the battle, he was found dead. His Yankee coat was full of rebel bullet holes, and his rebel pants were full of Yankee bullet holes. Folks, the problem is very simple. There's a war going on. We are in the center of the battlefield. This is the greatest war in history. All you need to do is decide who you want to fight for and get busy and work for your general. You cannot be neutral. You are either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the devil. You cannot be neutral in this war. There's a battle going on. Now, we as Christians have a tremendous advantage. We have a book that tells us how it turns out. See, and I read the last chapter, and we win. Okay? So what I'm going to share with you tonight might be a little scary in some points, but listen, don't get nervous, just it's time to get busy. It's time to pour on the coals. We're going to trace a little bit of the history of the war against God to try to give you an understanding so you can see how it fits in with what we should be doing today. See. God created the world and he makes the rules. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He created it. About 6,000 years ago this happened. Satan, somewhere along the line shortly after that, decided he wanted to be God. I suspect that Satan fell from heaven about 100 years after the creation, certainly before Cain and Abel were born. That's the first date we've got. Adam was 130 when that happened. We cover more on that on video number seven. But Lucifer, who became the devil, the Bible says he was perfect in his days, in his ways, from the day he was created. So he was one of the created beings, and Exodus 20 tells us everything was created in six days. So Lucifer also was one of the created beings during those six days. He did not fall from heaven before the creation. Okay? Ezekiel tells us his heart was lifted up because of his beauty and his riches and his power. And God said, I'm going to cast you to the ground. Isaiah tells us, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Did you know it is Satan that is weakening the nations? He said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, Satan wants to be God. But the job is not available, and he's all upset about that. So he's decided, since he can't be God, he's going to destroy God's creation, which is us. The Bible says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? I think when we see Satan, we're going to say, That's it? 
This puny little fella, he was the one causing all the trouble? How many saw the Wizard of Oz, you know, when Dorothy finally got behind that curtain and saw that little old man, you know, back there pulling the strings and making the smoke? And this is the guy that did all this. <laughs> Whenever I think of this verse, I think of the Wizard of Oz, you know. Satan's a puny little man who thinks he's, gonna, he's doing great things. And we're all going to be amazed at how puny he is when we get to see him. This is the man that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and opened not the house of his prisoners. Well, in the meantime, things are looking pretty bleak, okay? Satan and his followers are busy making their plans to rule the world. Kind of like Pinky and the Brain. How many have seen that show, Pinky and the Brain? <laughs> That's hilarious, okay? But we don't need to be nervous, folks. In Psalms chapter 2, the Bible tells us, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Did you know God sees everything that's going on? He sees these people planning to rule the world, and he's laughing about it. And if we're God's children, you just stay close to God and everything will be fine. Okay? There are some troublous times coming, folks, in the very near future. There have been more Christians killed in the last 100 years than in the last 1,000 years before that. There's a real persecution of Christians going on all across this planet. It hasn't hit America very bad yet, but it's coming, folks. Satan tricked Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said? Notice the first thing he did was to raise doubts about God's word. The second thing he said was, Ye shall not surely die. Now he is calling God a liar. He's denying God's word. The third thing he said to Eve was, Ye shall be as gods. He deified mankind. Eve, you do what I tell you and you get to be God. Boy, the Islams have followed that one, haven't they? So have the Muslims. And, I mean, the Muslims, the religion teaches, you know, when you die, if you're a good Muslim, you get to go to heaven and have 72 wives. You get to be a god of your own little universe. The Mormons teach the same idea. I mean, 72 mother-in-laws. That's not heaven. Okay. Uh, actually, my wife had a great mother-in-law. But uh, uh, Satan's technique has always been the same thing, folks, okay? He wants to make you doubt God's word, he wants to deny God's word, and he wants to deify mankind. Ye shall be as gods. That's what he did to Jesus, remember? After when Jesus was tempted, he said, hey, Jesus, fall down and worship me. I will give you all these kingdoms. He always does the same thing, folks. His tricks are the same. The, Lord, the devil took him up into a tall mountain and said, all these kingdoms of the world and the glory of them will I give you. If you fall down and worship me, Jesus didn't fall for it. He said, get thee behind, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You know, a satanic high priest named Alistair Crawley claimed that his demon, Oasis, uh, I, I was, told him the year 2000 would mark the end of the superstition of Christianity and the beginning of the golden age when those possessing the will to dominate and conquer would ascend to godhood. Now, Robin, you do a lot of taping of uh, satanic type stuff and, you know, get into this, uh, and Robin's running the camera back here. The Satan, Satan worshipers think they're going to get to become God. It's silly now, but, you know, they're teaching. Man has evolved as far as he can go physically, and next we're going to evolve spiritually where we get to realize we are God. See, what you believe determines your behavior. Belief determines your behavior. A lot of folks have attempted to rule the world because of their philosophy. They think they are God. Now, the Bible says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Philosophy comes from the word philio, which means love of. Sophie means man's wisdom. The love of man's wisdom, philosophy. Dr. Henry Morris has a great book, Tracing the History of Evolutionary Thought. If I had to recommend five books to read for a person that wants to get involved in the creation movement, this would certainly be one of those five. You need to read this one to see the history of evolution called The Long War Against God. Now, some people reasoned if there is no God and if man evolved from dark-skinned apes, then the colored man must be less evolved than others. Racism has always been in the world, but I tell you what, when evolution hit the scene, racism really took off. Evolution is the foundation 
for racism. Notice the title to Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. There's more to the title, as I'll show you in a minute. Now, his book came out 1859. Evolution came out way before that. Darwin just simply made the theory popular. Okay? And, of course, racism was already in the world. But this book justified racism. They claim these monkeys are different species of monkeys. The origin of species. Well, they're still the same kind of creature. They're all the same. They're a monkey. Okay. Here's more of the title. This book says, Darwin wrote a book titled, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Oh, now that gives you a little more of the title. But let me show you the entire title. You see, back in those days, books had long titles. Here is the entire title to Darwin's book. On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Favored races? What do you mean by that, Charlie? You mean one race is better than others? Oh, that's exactly what he meant, folks. Darwin was a racist. He thought natives were just advanced animals. Hmm. In Darwin's book, he said on page 243, Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals. Who are these higher and lower animals? Hmm, interesting. Well, back in 1859, of course, America still had slavery. You could buy Negroes like cows. Slavery was in America and in many other countries of the world. So, uh, Darwin's book really threw gasoline on that fire of racism. Henry Fairfield Osborne was the curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He said, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. If a museum curator said that today, how long would he keep his job? Or his life? Hmm? Stephen Gould at Harvard University said biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Thomas Huxley is the guy who got everybody believing in Darwin. Huxley said, no rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes that the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. Priestley, the guy, the, the Anglican priest who really promoted Darwin, said the black people of Australia, exactly the same race as the African Negro, cannot take in the gospel. I ran a bus route for 17 years in all black neighborhoods. I have brought thousands and thousands of black people to church and to Jesus Christ. Okay? And I loved the ministry. Much friendlier folks than many. Okay? You go knock on the door, they invite you in, you sit down for supper, and you're sitting there eating. By the way, what's your name? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's really a neat society to work with. I loved it. One night I couldn't sleep, so about 2 o'clock in the morning, I was out driving to my bus route. We had a ghetto-type area where I went in there, picked up kids, and brought them to church. And here it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and some guy had been out drinking, and he turned his car down what he thought was the road, but instead it was the railroad track. He drove down the railroad track a little ways, and the car bottomed out and was stuck on the rails, you know. And so I saw this unusual sight and thought I would help the guy get out of the car before a train came by and killed him. So I'm standing over there, you know, trying to get this guy out of the car so I can push his car off the track. Another man stopped to help me. And we're pushing the car back off the tracks. And the guy says, hey, what are you doing out here in this part of town? I said, well, I run a bus over here and I pick up folks in, uh, out of this community and bring them to church. He said, in there? He said, that's an all-black neighborhood. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know almost everybody in there. He said, you do what with them? I said, I bring them to church, you know, show them how to get saved and go to heaven. He said, those are black folks. They can't be saved. They don't, they don't have a soul. That's what he told me. I said, are, are you from the KKK? He said, how did you know? <laughs> That's a lucky guess. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what Priestley said, too. He said, they cannot take in the gospel. All attempts to bring them to knowledge of the true God have as yet failed utterly. Poor brutes in human shape, they must perish off the face of the earth like brute beasts. This is an Anglican priest. Now, see, the scientists rejected Darwin when he came out. As his book was written, the scientists said, this is a stupid theory. The preachers and the priests, especially in England, accepted Darwin. 
they started preaching Darwin from their pulpits. And it was the preachers that accepted Darwin before the scientists did in 1859. Here's the Mormon official doctrine. Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this delegation of authority from the Almighty. The gospel message of salvation is not carried affirmatively to them. Negroes are not equal with other races where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned, particularly to the priesthood and the temple blessings that flow therefrom. But this inequality is not of man's origin. It is the Lord's doing. It is based on his eternal laws of justice and grows out of a lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. What's he talking about here? The Negroes were not valiant in their first estate? I had a couple of uh, Mormon missionaries knock at my door one time. And they said, hello, Mr. Hoven, uh, we'd like to talk to you about the Lord. I said, that would be great. Which Lord would you like to talk about, yours or mine? They said, oh, there's only one Lord, the Lord God Almighty. I said, no, no, fellas, you have a very different Lord than I do. He said, no, we worship the same God. I said, no, you don't. I said, tell me, fellas, does your God have a body like mine? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, well, my Bible says uh, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in his spirit and in truth. And if he has a body, how can he be all places at the same time? Hmm, think about it. I said, does your God live on the planet Kolob, K-O-L-O-B? They said, well, yeah, we believe he does. I said, well, I taught earth science for years, which includes astronomy, and I don't have any idea where Kolob is, neither does anybody else, but let's assume that's true. I said, uh, does your God have thousands of wives? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, does your God have normal physical relations with his thousands of wives in Kolob? And they produce spirit babies. And they said, yes, we believe that's what happens. I said, and uh, if the spirit baby... The, the human couple on earth only produces the body, but your God produces the spirit. Is that what you believe? They said, yes, that's what we believe. I said, now, fellas, let me tell you. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that your God has these spirit babies up on Kolob, and if they're a good spirit baby and they're valiant, they come down to earth and they get a body with white skin? If they're a bad spirit baby, they come down and get a body with black skin. Is that what you believe? He said, well, you're, you're not supposed to know that, but <clears throat> yes, that is what we believe. I said, now, fellas, listen, I know you have the tag that says elder, even though you're 17. <laughs> Let me explain something to you. Your God on Kolob has to supply a spirit for every baby born on earth. And he does it up there to supply the spirit the same way people do it down here to get the body. Is that what you're telling me? They said, yeah, that's right. I said, fellas, I taught biology and anatomy for years. I have been married 20 years at that time. It's 28 now. I said, I have three kids, one of each. I delivered one at home. I said, kids, uh, I said, fellas, there are two babies born on earth every second, 24 hours a day, round the clock, nonstop. And your God supplies a spirit for everyone. When does he get time to answer your prayers? <laughs> You can see the light slowly starting to come on in the back of their little brain, like, wow, that would be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so they dusted the, you know, dusted their feet off, and I guess I was anathema from then on or something. They never came back, so all I know. <laughs> what a dumb religion. But I tell you what, Islam is just as stupid. They're both the same thing, folks. Only one has a diaper on their head, but they teach their folks, look. If you're a good Mormon or if you're a good Islam, you get to go to heaven and have all these thousands of wives. It's all based on lust. That's what those religions are based on. Nothing but animal lust. Let's go on here. However, in a broad sense, general sense, caste systems have their root and origin in the gospel itself. And when they operate according to the divine decree, the resultant restrictions and segregation are right and proper and have approval of the Lord. To illustrate, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race have been cursed with the black skin, the mark of Cain. This is Mormon teaching, folks. Mormon apostle Mark Peterson said, If there is one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I have read to you, they receive the curse. Mormon president Brigham Young said, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. Hmm. 
we can talk more about that if you'd like, but there are some good books about Mormonism, like well, The Secret History of Mormonism, that we cover on our seminar part one. You can get the title and get that book. That'll really <laughs> curl your hair. Okay. Slaves were treated like animals. They were packed into ships. They were chained to the deck. They could not move. That place where they sat on the deck is where they ate and slept and went to the bathroom. That's where they lived for three or four weeks while they sailed across the ocean. At a very high loss rate, sometimes as high as 20 percent, so they started packing them not quite so tight. They were just simply treated like animals. You could buy them and sell them on the open market. Some people thought the people in Australia were a classic example of a missing link because their jaw bones are bigger than average humans. And they said, see, this proves they're a missing link. Well, the reason they have bigger jaws is because Aborigines wander around in the outback. They don't want to carry a toolbox with them everywhere they go. They're a nomadic people. So <coughs> they use their teeth as a vice. They're going to clamp down on the tree branch to strip the bark off to make a tool or something. They're, they're constantly using their jaws. Not just for talking, but really, really hard use on the jaws, which makes the muscles get bigger. And any bodybuilder can tell you the bigger the muscles get, the bigger the bones get. Bones grow in response to muscle growth. And so they have bigger jaws because of their lifestyle, not because of evolution. But the Aborigines were rounded up and shot because people thought they were an inferior species. Every single one of them from Tasmania was killed. There are no Tasmanian Aborigines alive today. Last one killed in 1908. If you've ever seen the movie Quigley Down Under, you know, they brought Quigley out there to shoot the Aborigines. That's what they wanted him to do. That stuff really happened, folks. They were killing them. They were putting them and making slaves out of them, doing all sorts of mean things to these Aborigines. One missionary actually witnessed this, and the story's in Creation Magazine. These two folks were going around collecting skulls for museums to be displays for missing links. Here's the story the missionary said right here. A New South Wales missionary was the horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of aboriginal men, women, and children. Forty-five heads were then boiled down, and the best ten skulls were packed off for overseas. They shot them to get their heads for museum displays. Did you know the Smithsonian has 33,000 sets of human remains in their basement right now? It's called the Army of the Potomac. 33,000. Did you know in 1904 in St. Louis, the World's Fair had an expedition, exposition with over 2,000 what they said were primitive people? Uh, anthropologist W.J. McGee designed the whole display. They were going to demonstrate how white man was superior. Where the, where the uh, St. Louis World's Fair was held is now, today, the St. Louis Zoo. One of the cages that held Otabenga is still up today, as far as I know. And it was where they kept Otabenga in with chimpanzees. He was a pygmy from Africa. They were demonstrating how close they were to the apes. Ota had a wife and two kids. He committed suicide over this. If you want to read more on Ota Benga, get the website uh, rae.org. You can see a lot more about what happened to Ota Benga. President Roosevelt was influenced by all this propaganda. He believed there were inferior races also, but he thought the Indians were inferior. See, Roosevelt said, I wish very much the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. He thought that immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orient were a threat to American society because they were inferior. How many of you have ancestry from one of those places? <laughs> Just about everybody in the room, right? Okay. In 1871, Congress scrapped all treaties with the Indians and moved them off to the reservation system we still have today. Because our leaders thought the evolution was true and the Indians are an inferior species. The Trail of Tears took place before Darwin's book came out, but not before the evolution theory was popular. This is when people thought they were inferior species. The Trail of Tears is when they took the Cherokees and Creek Indians and moved them off to Oklahoma. One third of them died along the way. Cherokee forced expulsion from their lands. Sam Houston lived in the, with the Cherokees, even had a Cherokee wife. 1838, the Cherokees were forced from their homes and their city, Ross's Landing, was renamed to Chattanooga, so people would forget about what happened. 
Chattanooga, Tennessee, used to be called Ross's Landing, named after Chief Ross of the Cherokees. Now, the Cherokee Indians were trying very hard to blend in with the white man's way of thinking. They had farms. They taught their people an alphabet. And Chief uh, Sequoia taught all, of, all the Cherokees to read in just three months. Amazing progress they had made. But they moved them off, and one-third of them died along the way. You ought to read about the Trail of Tears. And get, but you need to understand how evolution ties in, or it won't make any sense. Okay? Our leaders really thought they were an inferior species. My Bible says we all have one father. Okay? We all came from Adam and later from Noah. The Bible says he hath made of one blood all nations of men to rule on the earth. And if you are a racist or you think you are superior because of the color of your skin, you are a hypocrite. I wouldn't know if I know how to spell it, I'd spell it for you, but it starts with an H. Hypocrite, okay? Darwin also thought that women were inferior. He said, a married man is a poor slave, worse than a Negro. If a professor said that today in his class, how long would he keep his job or his life? And yet, Darwin said this, and tomorrow in school, kids are going to be taught that Darwin was a great scientist and a great man. He was a racist and a chauvinist. Darwin said, the chief distinction in intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than can woman. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of senses and hands, the average mental power of man must be above that of woman. Boy, Charlie finally married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. Nobody else would marry him. Darwin said, uh, thus from the ultimate, man has ultimately become superior to woman. Poetry, strength, voice, etc. Darwin believed in inbreeding. He married his maternal father's granddaughter, his first cousin, who was also his mother's niece. They wanted to produce a superior stock. They had ten children. Mary died shortly after birth. Anne died age 10. Robert was born retarded, died at 19 months. Henrietta had a serious breakdown at age 15. Three of his six other sons were ill so often, Charles regarded them as semi-invalids. So much for inbreeding, Charlie. Evolution is also the foundation for communism. Communism is the base, is based on evolution theory that removes God and puts man in his place. The founder of the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, said communism is the goal. That's the stated purpose of the ACLU. Now, Karl Marx is the founder of communism. He was originally named uh, Moses Mordecai Marx Levy, alias Karl Marx. At age 17, he wrote a beautiful paper telling of how much he loved the Lord. Then he went off to college. And a professor turned his head away from Christianity and turned him to atheism and to the occult. Wonder how many kids have gone to college and lost their faith because some professor destroyed it? I remember my first year in, my first day in sociology class at Illinois Central College. The teacher got up in class and said, uh, are there any Christians in the room? This is my first day in sociology class at the heathen school. I raised my hand. I said, yes, sir. Looks like I'm it. He said, what's your name? I said, Kent Hoven. He said, oh, Hoven, uh, you're a Christian, huh? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, tell me, can God do anything? This is my first day in sociology class. What are we talking about me and God for? I mean, come on, let's teach me the subject, would you? I didn't know how to answer the question, so I said, yes, God can do anything. By the way, that's not true. <laughs> Some things God cannot do. He cannot learn. He already knows it all. Okay. <laughs> he cannot sin. <laughs> okay. um, I said, yes, God can do anything. And he said, well, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? I said, well, he can make a rock so big you can't lift it. No problem. By the way, Jesus often answered a question with a question, right? I've learned how to answer these idiots now when they say that. So he said, no, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? I'll say, well, tell me, uh, have you had geometry? And they'll typically say yes. I said, okay, good. I taught geometry for years. So tell me, a line goes forever in both directions. Is that right? They said, that's correct. Okay. A ray goes forever in one direction. Is that right? I said, right. 
I said, okay, now let me see if I got this straight. A line goes forever in both directions. A ray goes forever in one direction. Which one is longer? You tell me which one's longer, and I'll tell you about the rock, okay? 75% of kids from Christian homes who go to public schools are going to reject the Christian faith after one year of college. Karl Marx later said, my objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Professor uh, Wilson at Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I entered the Southern Baptist Church, with, when I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. Destroyed his faith. Scott wrote me this letter and said, Dr. Oban, until I went to college, my faith in God was sound, but my college history class helped to destroy that faith. I started to doubt the Bible and God's Word. I even started to doubt Jesus Christ was truly God's Son and that He died and rose from my sins. My best friend showed me your tapes and I was in awe of what I saw. Everything I thought I knew about life was changed. I've been praying every day that I would get a chance to talk to Tom Hanks, the movie star. Because Tom Hanks, I read when he was 16, he got saved. And I just suspect his first year in college, somebody turned him on to evolution theory and turned him away from God. And that's, I just think that's what happened to Tom. And I don't know why. I'm just burdened for Tom Hanks. I pray for him every day. I want to win him back to Christ. And I'm just willing to bet what happened first or second year of college, it was this evolution theory that got him. And if somebody knows Tom, give him this tape. Tom, I love you and I'm praying for you and I'm going to get you converted before it's over with. Okay? Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. Well, that's the truth, folks. Hmm. Karl Marx based his philosophy of communism on evolution. He even tried to dedicate his book to Charles Darwin. Dedicated to Charles Darwin from a sincere admirer, Karl Marx, 1873. Interesting. Karl Marx had six children. Three died of starvation in infancy. The guy never worked a day in his life. He's a lazy bum. That's the days before they had the little cardboard sign, you know, we'll work for food. He didn't even hold up the sign, okay? Two other kids committed suicide. When Marx died, only six people attended his funeral. He was a loser all the way around. But Karl Marx left a legacy. He left us the Communist Manifesto of 1848. There are ten planks to the Communist Manifesto. All of them are based on anything that is anti-Christian. If God's for it, Marx was against it. The first plank was to abolish private property. Hmm. The Bible's real clear about private property. You know, they had a system set up in the Bible where if you lost your property, your family would get it back every 50 years, the year of Jubilee. You couldn't possibly lose your property forever because God knows you can't have real freedom unless you have private property ownership. Christianity and uh, God's economy is based on property rights, property ownership. Every man has his own vine and his own fig tree. You provide for your own. If any man provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel. Hath denied the faith, the Bible says. Drink water out of your own cistern, and running water is out of your own well, says in Proverbs chapter 5. Peter Burrell, the president of the National Audubon Society, said, we reject the idea of private property. Wow, he's been reading Karl Marx, hasn't he? There's a Pledge of Allegiance for third graders in a public school in Massachusetts. I pledge allegiance to the earth, which I do love and depend on, and to all life on land, air, and sea, which is as much a part of the earth as me. Third grade, for Wisconsin Public School. I pledge allegiance to the world, to care for earth, sea, and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. A couple of months ago, Jacob Bredston 
here's his phone number, told me that when he was in third grade at Johnston Elementary School in Blaine, Minnesota, his teacher, Ms. Klop Hockey, took down the American flag and made the kids pledge to the earth instead. Well, Ms. Claude Hoppy, I will buy you a one-way ticket to the Soviet Union if you promise to stay. I've been there. You don't want what they've got over there. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Hmm. There are two basic philosophies of how man ought to be governed. One is based upon evolution thinking which says laws come from man's opinion. After all, if there is no God, then we must be it, folks. We, must, we better decide what's right and wrong. Rights are granted by the government, and the government should be the provider. Government should provide everything. That's really based on evolution thinking. It's called a democracy. And democracies are terrible forms of government. I sat by a lady on the airplane coming up here who was telling me how the government ought to do this and the government ought to do that, the government ought to provide this. And I said, ma'am, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Did you know our founding fathers had a different philosophy? They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Hey, where do rights come from? They come from the creator. Do you have the right to get married? Yeah. Where does this right come from? From God. Well, then why do we ask the state for permission? A lot of folks don't understand, but if you get a state marriage license, you've now entered into a contract between you and your husband or wife and the state you live in, and any children you produce belong to the state. And they can come take them away if they don't like the way you're raising them. And it all starts with that marriage contract. There was no such thing as a marriage license until about 100 years ago. Listen to the preacher. It makes me nervous when I hear him say that. By the authority invested in me by the state of Wisconsin, I now pronounce you man and wife. Now, you want to study that subject out real carefully. Get the website hushmoney.com or .org. You can get a lot more on that. Hushmoney.com. Here it is. Same thing with churches. Why do churches ask the government for permission to exist by becoming a 501c3 corporation? You better, t Peter Kershaw has written the book, not only Hush Money, but also uh, In Caesar's Grip, that you better read before you decide you want your church to be incorporated. See, our ministry, CSE ministry, is not incorporated. It's not a 501c3 corporation. And we have a very interesting time with the county officials in our county because they think they have authority over our ministry. And they don't. God has authority over it, and Christians died by the millions to preserve that fundamental right. We'll get into more of that some other time. But our founding fathers believed that this country was founded by Christians on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The other philosophy is what our founding fathers said, that creation is, is true, and laws come from the Creator, rights are unalienable, and the government should be limited to two things. Punish evildoers and defend us from outside invaders. Those are the only two legitimate functions of government. They should not be involved in welfare. They should not be involved in education. It's called a constitutional republic. That's how it started, folks. But evolution says, oh, no, man's in charge, so we better decide truth and better decide right and wrong. And it all, the basic philosophies of government are really based on creation or evolution. Second plank in Karl Marx's manifesto was a heavy progressive income tax. Don't get me started on that one. We have a long 30-page letter we can send you on that one. Send our office a few bucks to cover copies, and we'll send you our 30-page letter about this topic right here. Okay? The third one was abolish the rights of inheritance. The huh. Bible says a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. Karl Marx wanted to abolish the rights of inheritance. See, if God's for it, he's against it. Number four, confiscate property rights. Number five, a central bank. Remember, love of money, root of all evil. 1913, we got a creature from Jekyll Island, Georgia, called the Federal Reserve. You ought to read that book and find the history behind the Federal Reserve. Nothing federal about it, and there are no reserves. It's no more federal than the Federal Express or Federal Rifle Shells. 
Love of money root of all evil. The Bible says the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You see, the rich folks wanted to figure out a way to get all of the money. They would like everybody in debt to them. So that when you work, part of your money goes to them, even though they didn't do the work. You did the work, but they get part of the money. That's how debt works, isn't it? If you borrow money for a house or a car, well, then you work to pay for, to give some of it away. Interesting. For centuries, the alchemists sought for ways to turn lead into gold. They failed. But the bankers discovered a way to do it. Start wars and finance both sides. Interesting. After the lead stops flying, the gold rolls in as interest payments on the national debt. But you know, during World War II, U.S. debt rose almost 600%. Japanese debt rose 1,300%. French debt rose almost 600%. Canadian debt rose 400%. Debt to who? Who do we owe this money to? What's the national debt now? Like 17 trillion when they're really honest and put all the numbers on the table? Who do we owe this money to? Every one of you is carrying in your wallet or your purse evidence of our debt. You want to see it? This is not a $5 bill. This is a debt note. This is proof of our debt. Federal Reserve note. This is not money, folks. That'd take a long time to explain all that, but the national debt is absolutely staggering. See, uh, Nehemiah said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and upon our lands and vineyards, and lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. I'm afraid we've got our sons and grand, grandsons and great-grandsons in debt already right now, folks. Here's to give you a little bit of the history of the love of money and how this ties in. Okay? In 1776, we fought a war with England and gained independence from England and from the Bank of England. Only Congress had power to coin money. Jefferson warned if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of currency, by the way, Federal Reserves are private banks, okay? first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. In 1792, Alexander Hamilton established a 20-year charter with the Bank of England. Big mistake, Alex. In 1812, renewal was denied and war broke out. England said, okay, charter's up. We want the colonies back. That's what the War of 1812 was really about, okay? 1833, Andrew Jackson removed all monies from the chartered banks and put them into state banks. In 1836, the rich men, the Rockefellers, Rothschilds, these kind of guys, had Mexico invade Texas, started a war to punish America for not keeping their money in the, his banks. In 1861, these same rich men helped create the Civil War to disrupt the economy. They wanted to create debt and get their power back. See, they have power when everybody's in debt to them. They love it when Congress issues more money because they just print it and it's more debt. In 1861, the Industrial Revolution created great wealth in the hands of a few. You ought to read the book, The Robber Barons, for more on that. In 1907, banker J.P. Morgan deliberately created the financial panic to promote the idea of a central bank. In 1912, the communist Marxist Colonel House, who was Wilson's uh, alter ego, he was in the Wilson administration, he wrote a book called Philip Drew, Administrator, to explain his conspiracy to establish a central bank and create a progressive income tax. 1913, Federal Reserve Act was passed and Federal Income Tax Act was passed. December 23rd, two days before Christmas, the Federal Reserve Act passed, then the 16th Amendment was passed. Now this is the greatest hoax in history. All the senators had gone home. This is Christmas. Colonel House walks in, announces to practically an empty Senate, the 16th Amendment has passed. Now, when an amendment passes, all the states have to ratify it. When this 16th Amendment to allow for the income tax went out to all the different states, almost every state didn't even vote on it. When it came up for issue, they said, this is unconstitutional. We passed. We're not going to vote on it. So when they said passed, that didn't mean they agreed. That means they didn't want to vote on it. 
16th Amendment was never ratified. The law that never was, okay? That's a long, interesting story. Anyway, uh, in 1916, Wilson, reflecting on the Federal Reserve Act, said, I have unwittingly ruined my country. From 1920 to 1929, the bankers increased the money supply by 62% to create the Roaring Twenties and brought people into the stock market. October 1929, the bankers called in their loans and sent the economy into the Great Depression. This was intentionally done. And then helped create the New Deal programs where they could loan the government money to rescue the economy. And guess who we're in debt to? Same guys. In June 1932, Congressman Louis McFadden gave his powerful speech to Congress spelling out who had caused the Depression. On the third try, they finally had him assassinated. Congressman Louis McFadden. There was also Lindbergh was very much out, outspoken against uh, the banking system, and he ended up getting his baby kidnapped and murdered because of this same issue. Okay, 1933, the government debt to the bankers began to grow steadily. Millions readily accepted a social security number, hmm. which, by the way, is voluntary, and I don't have one. Okay. The rich men then tricked people into getting a social security number in order to get their benefits from the government. As usual, they created a crisis, the Depression, to encourage compliance. Here's an original social security card. Look what it says. Not for identification. Hmm. New ones, you have to have for, social, for identification for just about everything, don't you? Look, if anybody asks for your social security number, just say, it's none of your business. I applied for insurance, and they said, uh, I, for life insurance. And they said, oh, you don't have a social security number. Can't have insurance. I wrote them a letter. I said, I'd like insurance. Please insure me. They said, no, not without a social security number. So we're suing them for big bucks for discriminating against me. That should come to a head in the next couple of weeks. Call me, and I'll let you know how it turns out. I may able to be, might be able to fly all of you down to Florida to see our place. Okay? Here's a... Go to the local post office and pick up a draft notice for you kids, selective service. Look what it says here. If you have a social security number, it is mandatory you include this information. If you don't have one, leave this block blank. It is not mandatory to have a social security number. They want you to think it is, but it is totally voluntary. What happened, we traded our real money, which is silver and gold, for worthless paper. Real soon, those who control the real money will require all transactions to be controlled electronically by an embedded chip. I have in my wallet a $5 Federal Reserve note from 1928. Very interesting reading. Look what it says here. Redeemable in gold on demand at the United States Treasury or in gold or lawful money at any Federal Reserve Bank. What are, they, what are they telling me? I can trade this in for gold, or I can trade it in for lawful money. Isn't that what it says? You mean this is not lawful money? Uh, no, this is a Federal Reserve note. This is a debt note. This is not money. We've got a whole generation now who grows up thinking this is money, and it is not money, folks. It is a note. It's a debt note. That would be a long, interesting study. Also, you may want to get into. Then in 1933, a couple years after this was issued, President Roosevelt declared to Congress of Governors that a national state of emergency existed. The Great Depression was going on. So the governors voted unanimously to give the president emergency power to wage war on the economy. Hmm. These powers would not be available under normal constitutional process. March 1933, Congress voted to give the President of the United States and to the Secretary of the Treasury the emergency powers sanctioned to wage war through executive orders. Abraham Lincoln issued the first executive order to bring troops into the South. And by the way, I love my country, but the wrong side won that war. That war was not about slavery. That war was about states' rights. That's another long, interesting story. But in... Uh, 1933, Section 5B of the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917 was amended to include the citizens of the United States. By the way, capital U, capital S, 
you don't want to be a citizen of that one. You want to be a citizen of the small U, capital S. That's another long, interesting story. Okay. By and through their ability to own gold and silver as an enemy of the United States. In 1933, they said, if you own gold, you're an enemy of the country. Everybody turned their gold in to the government, 1933. Then in 1934, this note was issued, which I have in my collection at home. It says right here, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or at any Federal Reserve Bank. That's still not lawful money, folks. It's fraudulent. See, the note is evidence of debt, not money. The Coinage Act of 1792, which has never been revoked, defines a dollar as 25.8 grains of gold or 412 grains of silver. That's why a silver dollar was always the same size. It had to be 90% silver and had to weigh a certain amount. And it was a real lawful dollar. There's the new euro currency. European common market. Interesting. Notice the woman riding on the beast here in both the coins and the dollars. Revelation 17. He carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The beast has seven heads and ten horns on the European currency. Interesting. There's the Bank of England ten-pound note with Charles Darwin's picture on there. Now, that's interesting. If you want to study more about the Federal Reserve, you ought to get that book on the horns of the beast. To see more about the money issue, you can call, uh, our, our ministry can order it for you. You can get it through us, uh, or you can get it right there off uh, uh, this phone number on the screen. Or get this one to see how the Rockefeller family has been involved in all of this. You know, Khrushchev used to brag that he got all of his secrets from Rockefeller's CIA. By the way, the CIA was not a government organization. It was a private organization. Long story there. Basically, they took away our gold and gave us paper. Federal Reserve notes. Next, they're going to take away the paper and give us plastic. We have to have a record of the transaction. There's no record of a paper transaction. Now, with computers, there can be a record of every transaction that's made. Finally, they're going to take away the plastic and put a mark in the hand or forehead. Coming soon. In Pensacola, a couple years ago, they had a festival. Cash was not allowed. You could not spend money, you, or Federal Reserve notes. You had to have a card. Interesting. And we could talk a long time about the mark of the beast, but you might want to get a hold of Carl Sanders, a friend of mine in Arkansas, Mountain View, Arkansas. He's one of the guys who helped develop the microchip. And now he travels and speaks about the dangers of the microchip in the future of the world, how that's going to be probably the mark of the beast or something similar to that. And we also want to get a hold of Dean Martin, a friend of mine in Pensacola. I'd like to have a name like that, Dean Martin. But the, <laughs> that's his name. He's a great guy. He has a lot of information and has a demonstration he puts on with the microchip to let people know where the technology is going, okay? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, he causeth all, talking about Satan, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in the forehead. This was prophesied 2,000 years ago. And he said, without the mark, you cannot buy or sell. Revelation 14, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall, be, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Don't receive the mark. <laughs> You know, I don't think there's going to be a time, preacher, when we can just stand up and take a stand against the mark. I think it's going to be a slow, gradual choking process where all of a sudden certain stores just, uh, you don't have a mark, I'm sorry, you don't buy here. You're just gradually going to phase out the Christians who refuse this mark. It's not going to be a big glorious deal where you get to stand up. You're just slowly going to starve to death. I don't, I don't know, but I suspect that's what's coming. I know in Washington, D.C., you cannot ride the bus or the transit system unless you have a card in your wallet, which has a microchip embedded in it. And you don't even take it out of your wallet. You step up on the bus and you walk through this little archway and automatically deducts the fare from your card. There are places where you can recharge your card all around the city. But if you don't have a card, you don't ride the bus. And it will get to the point where if you don't have a chip in your hand or your forehead, you don't go in the store. 
or you don't buy or sell. Mark my words, that's what the Bible prophesied. It's coming, folks, to a city near you. They now have Speed Pass, where you can have this little chip, little microchip. You put it on your key ring, you walk up to get gas, you touch the pump, you fill it up, and you drive off. How many have seen those? I've seen several of you in the church that already have them, okay? Not that it's good or bad, I'm just saying it's probably the forerunner. This is headed that way, folks, all right? Microchips are very fascinating. The technology is incredible what's happened in the last 20 years here with this microchip technology. They now have these little tiny chips. Hitachi Corporation just a few weeks ago, or a couple months ago, came out with the Mu chip, one half millimeter, the size of a period on a piece of paper. That can hold 128 bits of information. Not much, but it's enough to give you a number by which you can be identified. They can put these chips into a piece of paper, and every single item will have a number, and it's headed to an electronic system. What's going to happen in the future? You walk into the grocery store, you gather up everything you want, and you push the cart outside, and there are no checkouts. It's automatically deducted from your account. But in order to do that, you will have to have a chip. Well, that's interesting. That's also going to make it kind of easy to track people that the government's looking for, isn't it? They always create a crisis to get people to accept this new idea. That's how the Social Security got in. Mondex Corporation, Mon for monetary and Dex for Dexter. Monetary means uh, pertaining to money. Dexter means belonging to or located on the right hand. MasterCard has 51% ownership of Mondex. Um, one of the folks from Mondex, Robin Kelly, said, this is the final stage in becoming a global reality, said Robin Kelly of Mondex International. With MasterCard's backing, there's nothing to stop Mondex from becoming the global standard. Watch for smart cards, okay? They use the SET technology, which stands for Secure Electronic Transaction. By the way, SET is the Egyptian god of evil. Hmm. The SET mark. AT&T and Lucent Technologies purchased the franchise for Mondex USA. Their logo is the symbol of the solar serpent or the red dragon who is Satan. That's Lucifer's te Lucifer Technologies, uh, Lucent Technologies. Lucent is compound of Lucifer Enterprises. They seem to be quite flagrant in naming their products Styx, S-T-Y-X, that's a river in Hades. Janus, the two-faced god, Inferno, promoted with a quote from the Inferno, a story about Lucifer in the bowels of hell. This company deliberately, this is what I heard, chose to move their offices to 666 Fifth Avenue, Manhattan. That's uh, what this fellow told me on uh, this website. And I, I saw a picture of the building, and it was. Now, they may have moved since then. Karl Marx, though, in his plank number six, said you need government ownership of transportation. Did you know? Oh, we could go for two days on this one. I'm going to just touch it and go, and you're going to have a thousand questions after this, right? When a car is manufactured, it gets a certificate of origin, or a manufacturer's certificate of origin, MSO. When it's brought into the state, the state keeps that MSO in their files and issues a certificate of title. And so when you buy a new car, you don't really own the car. The state owns the car. You have to pay every year to keep a license plate on that car, don't you? But if you pay for the car from the dealer and you pay for it with gold or silver, real money, then you can get the Manufacturer Certificate of Origin, MSO, and now you don't ever need license plates. Because you really actually own the car. That's another long, interesting story. Enough said. Do some research. You'll find out I'm telling the truth. Okay. Number seven, government ownership of factories and agriculture. Number eight, government control of labor. Number nine, corporate farms and regional planning. Number ten, free education. Did you know the free public school idea was Karl Marx's plan? Huh. Hitler said, you let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Now, the public schools in America had some really good Christian roots. Here's a primer used in public schools, home schools, parochial schools until the 1900s. This is a first grade textbook. Look what they tell them. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. By the way, they used to make the letter S, so look like an F, okay? Heaven to find the Bible mind. 
Christ crucified for sinners died. The deluge drowned the earth around. Did you know the public schools taught Christianity for a long time? Here's lessons for youth using the alphabet. A. A wise son maketh a glad father. B. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. C. Come unto Christ, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Don't you wish kids would learn the alphabet that way today in public school? The United Nations uh, World Declaration on Education for All called for all the nations of the world to adopt a common education system complete with implementation timetables and recommended curriculum. In our own nation, Goals 2000, School to Work, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Profiles of Learning, now before Congress, are totally consistent with the One World Government recommendations of the UN Declaration. One of the guys in the Humanist magazine said, uh, the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith which will replace the rotting corpse of Christianity. Hmm. This guy said, every child who enters school at age five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance toward our elected officials, founding fathers, institutions, government, patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty. All these prove the child is sick because the well individual is one who has rejected all those things and is what I call the true international child of the future. Read that, communist. Okay. This is a social studies book by HBJ, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. It said, any child who believes in God is mentally ill. Humanist Magazine ran this article in 1930. It said, education is the most powerful ally of humanism, and every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday school, meeting once uh, an hour, for an hour once a week, and the teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? Good point. That's why we're losing them, folks. And some of you parents ought to go home and shut off that TV and study the Bible with your kids. As a matter of fact, this guy said creationism should be discriminated against. No advocate of such propaganda should be trusted to teach science classes or administer science programs anywhere under any circumstances. If they are doing so, they should be dismissed. Fire anybody who believes or teaches creation. An Iowa professor said, you should fail any student, no matter what the record, grade records indicate, if the professor discovers the student is a creationist. Furthermore, students department should have the right of retracting grades and possibly even degrees if the student becomes a creationist later. Well, he's real open-minded about this whole thing, isn't he? Mr. Yefremov lives in Pensacola, Florida. He's from uh, Ukraine. He has five children. His oldest uh, daughter is married to Bill, who's in charge of our maintenance department and our ministry, a lot of our ministry activities there. Her name is Ruth. She translated my material into Russian. Um, his son, David, did a lot of video editing. He worked with me for years before he went full-time with UPS. Mr. Yefremov came to my house one day. He, he speaks broken English. And uh, he laid his high school diploma on my desk. He said, Dr. Hovind, I got my high school diploma. I thought, okay, you're, uh, what, 55 years old? You have five kids, uh, three of them grown in college. Uh, why are you handing me your high school diploma? He said, oh, you must look at my report card. He showed me his Rus rep Russian report card. You know, I couldn't read it, but he said, this means A, and he had almost all A's and B's. I said, okay, yeah. He said, Mr. Hovind, you don't under understand. They just sent me my diploma 35 years later. I said, why? He said, when I was in high school in Russia, I took a test before I graduated. One of the questions on the test was, do you believe in evolution? I said, no. They refused to let me graduate. Mr. Yefremov did the voiceover when we put my tapes into Russian, the first tape. We've redone it since then. But our first Russian tape was Mr. Yefremov speaking Russian while I'm up there standing, moving my lips, you know. That tape was sent to his hometown. The mayor watched it and said, wow, the whole city council needs to see this. 
They had a city council meeting and they watched my seminar in Russian. The guy who had refused to give him the diploma 35 years ago was now a city council member. And the mayor said, oh, Eugene Yefremov went to America and made it big. Look, he's a movie star. <laughs> hey, send him his diploma. Interesting story. You ought to read the Fourth Reich of the Rich to see how a lot of this ties together. John D. Rockefeller is very influenced and in was very influential in using his money to ensure that the American school system became communistic, humanistic. Okay? Now listen, folks, I love my country, but I fear my government. And you better, too. Here are the communist rules for revolution. Rule number one, corrupt the young, get them away from religion. Rule number two, break down the moral virtues. Rule number three, encourage a soft government attitude toward crime. Number four, divide the people into hostile groups. Number five, get the people's minds off their government. Focus their attention on athletics or sex. Did you know in 1896 there were only 311 athletes in the Olympics? A hundred years later, there were 13,000 athletes in the Olympics. How many channels on TV now are devoted to athletics? How much money is spent in America on sports? If you consider all things involved, transportation to and from, buying the property, building the buildings. Folks, it's many, many, many billions and billions of dollars. So somebody can knock a ball into a hole in the dirt. Athletics has taken over our thinking process. There's an advertisement for a 50-inch TV. It says, football is a religion. Build a nice church. Rule number six, get control of all the media, like CNN, the Communist News Network. Rockefeller, international billionaire, humanist, CFR kingpin, and founder of the Trilateralist Commission, world order godfather, and in all probability, the high school graduate voted most likely to be hanged for treason voiced his praise of the controlled U.S. media for keeping their oath not to divulge the globalist plans to the public. Speaking to his fellow conspirators at a meeting in 1991 in uh, Baden, Germany, one of the more infamous world order group, the Bilderbergers, Rockefeller said, We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. In other words, they're having these meetings to, to determine world events. The news media is there, but they don't report to us what really goes on in those meetings. Because the average person shouldn't know what these guys are planning. They're making plans for a one world government. He went on to explain, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. The supranational, that means above the national sovereignty, of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely more preferable to the national autodeterminism practiced in past centuries. Richard Cohen of C CBS said, we are going to impose our agenda on the coverage by dealing with issues and subjects we choose to deal with. Remember when O.J. Simpson was on the news for almost a year? This was done intentionally to divert our attention away from the fact with what was happening with China being given the port in Los Angeles. China Gate was going on. They didn't want us to know about that, so they focused our attention on O.J. Simpson. Somebody said he's getting married again. He wants to take another stab at it. Oh. <laughs> Richard Salem, the former president of CBS News, said, Our job is to give the people not what they want, but what we decide they ought to have. New York Times is deliberately pitched to the liberal, read that, socialist, point of view, said the foreign editor of the New York Times, he ought to know. News reporters are certainly liberal and left of center. Walter Cronkite's one of the best of them, as far as left as you can get, okay? By the way, opposite of right is not left. Opposite of right is wrong. Mm -hmm. The news media in general are liberals, okay? Number seven, destroy people's faith in their leaders. Lenin, or Stalin, is attributed with this statement. He said, those who cast the votes decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. The last election ought to tell us something about that, right? 
Number eight, cause the registration of all firearms so that you can eventually confiscate them. Lenin said, one person with a gun can control 100 people without one. Now picture this. You're standing there in the bank to cash a check. Somebody walks in and holds up a gun and says, everybody lay on the floor. Everybody lays on the floor. Now picture this. Every red-blooded, honest, God-fearing American citizen is packing a gun. He's not looking for trouble. He's just, he just has a gun, just in case, you know. The guy walks into the bank, pulls out a gun. Everybody lay on the floor. Instantly, 80 guns are pointed at him. No, sir, you lay on the floor. Gun control is not about guns. It's about control. Every dictator has wanted gun control. Lenin wanted it, Stalin wanted it, Hitler wanted it. See, the one who has the gun is in control, and this goes back to the ye shall be as gods. You know, you are the boss. Goes right back to that, folks, okay? Don Boys, a good friend of mine, said gun control is not about guns, but control. Don said, you might be a liberal if you don't trust honest Americans with automatic weapons, but you do trust the government with them. You might be a liberal if you think guns are the cause of crime, but you don't think machine matches are the cause of arson. You might be a liberal if you think death penalty is government-sanctioned killing, but you don't think a prison sentence is government-sanctioned kidnapping. <laughs> I like this guy's thinking, okay? <laughs> Our founding fathers gave us the Second Amendment, which says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They gave us a Second Amendment so we could protect ourselves in case the government went bad. That's what it's for. See, the bad guys are not afraid of a few hundred people with guns. But if everybody's armed, it's going to be hard to take over a country if they know everybody's armed. Now, I told you in the other session that a lot of animals that eat grass have horns. You don't need horns to eat grass. You need horns as an education tool to educate the lion to stay off your back so you can eat the grass. That's what the horns are for, right? If the lions held a conference to outlaw horns on animals, they said it was dangerous to allow these untrained animals to have such dangerous weapons. They cited several examples where some animals had been accidentally, uh, accidentally been harmed by horns. You know, I bet if the lions could vote, they would vote that nobody should be allowed to have horns, wouldn't they? I bet they would. <laughs> That's what happened when the guys got shot in Colorado. Liberal news media right away jumped on the gun control issue. And we covered all that earlier. The issue is not about guns, folks. The real issue is should we have public schools, okay? Should we teach those kids evolution? And that's what happened in Colorado, okay? Hitler said, is at least, this is one quote I've not been able to prove, but I've had several folks tell me it's true, but I can't find it yet. He said, this year we'll go down in history. For the first time, a civilized nation had full gun registration. Our streets will be safer, our police more efficient, and the world will follow our lead into the future. Janet Reno said gun registration is not enough. Waiting periods are only a step. Registration is only a step. The prohibition of private firearms is the goal. Ohio Senator Metzenbaum said what good does it do to ban some guns? All guns should be banned. Sarah Brady of the Brady Bill said our task of creating a socialist America can only succeed when those who would resist have been totally disarmed. Bill Clinton said, and we should. Every community in the country could then start doing major weapon sweeps and then destroying the weapons, not selling them. And I misspelled his name on purpose to give it the Soviet flavor, okay? But you know, in the first 12 months after gun owners in Australia were forced to surrender 640,000 guns to the government, they destroyed them. A program cost the government $500 million. Well, after that happened, in the first 12 months, homicides nationwide were up 3.2%. Assaults went up 8.6%. Armed robberies went up 44%. In the state of Victoria, homicides with firearms are up 300%. Figures over the previous 25 years show a steady decrease in armed robbery with firearms. There's also been a dramatic increase in break-ins and assaults of the elderly. Hmm. In 1911, Turkey established gun control. Later, one and a half million Armenians, unable to defend themselves, were slaughtered.
1929, the Soviet Union established gun control, and for the next 30 years, 20 million dissidents, unable to defend themselves, were rounded up and slaughtered. 1938, Nazi gun control said Jews are prohibited from carrying firearms and ammunition. They established gun control in 1938, and for the next six years, at least 13 million Jews and others were rounded up and exterminated because they were unable to defend themselves, okay? China established gun control in 1935, and for the next 10 years, 20 million political dissidents unable to defend themselves were exterminated. Guatemala established gun control in 1964. In the next 15 years, 100,000 Mayan Indians unable to defend themselves were exterminated, killed, murdered. Uganda established gun control in 1970. For the next eight years, 300,000 Christians were murdered because they were unable to defend themselves. Cambodia established gun control in 1956, and from 75 to 77, one million educated people, maybe more, unable to defend themselves, rounded up and exterminated. Defenseless people around the country, around the world, exterminated in the 20th century about 56 million. Next time someone talks in favor of gun control, ask them, who do you want to round up and exterminate? See, with guns we are citizens, without guns we are subjects. Well said, Mr. Bracken. In 1982, the town of Kennesaw, Georgia, passed a law requiring all able adults, except convicts or conscientious objectors, to have a gun. You had to have a gun in Kennesaw, Georgia. They've had only one murder from an out-of-state criminal with a gun and have had no increase in crime or violence in 12 years. I mean, if you're a criminal, you going to go to a place like that? One of the major chains like AutoZone, it wasn't AutoZone, but one of the major auto parts chains, the government, the, their leader said, we're going to have a rule, no guns allowed in our stores. So they sent out a memo, everybody post a note on your store, no guns allowed. What does that say to a criminal? Rob me. <laughs> Isn't that what it says? You think that criminal's going to obey your sign? I can see it now. He's standing and holding a gun on the counter, on the guy behind the counter. The guy says, hey, can't you read that sign out there? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> the plan is very simple. You create a crisis, like blow up the Reichstag, like Hitler did, or blow up the Muir building, like our government did to get people to accept your solution, which is more anti-terrorist laws and gun control. And if you think Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma City building, you are really duped. <laughs> A long story behind that. The communist definition of peace is the absence of resistance. Now, communist is based on evolution. The idea that man can be God. Karl Marx talked about evolution all through his speeches. He kept talking about historical evolution is on your side. At a very early age, while still a pupil at the ecclesiastical school, a Christian school, Comrade Stalin developed a critical mind and revolutionary sentiments. He began to read Darwin and became an atheist. You know, Joseph Stalin went to a Christian school and Darwin's book turned him away from God. That's the book that influenced Joseph Stalin. Now, my daughter-in-law is from the Ukraine. Joseph Stalin intentionally killed 10 million people in the Ukraine. I've been there and preached over there, folks. It is a poverty-stricken country. That's the breadbasket of that whole area. I mean, they can grow more food than they could ever possibly eat. Communism has destroyed that place. Joseph Stalin, it's estimated that he killed between 60 and 100 million of his own people during his reign of terror. Nobody knows for sure. You've got to read some of the books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. If you can read a 900-page Russian book. I, I, somebody gave me one of these big books, you know, the Ar, uh, Gulag Archipelago. I said, oh, Hovind, you've got to read this. I said, yeah, right. Man, that thing's 12 feet thick. They said, okay, just read the first 10 pages. I said, all right, I'll read 10 pages. For the next three days, I couldn't put it down. I was up day and night reading that whole book. I couldn't believe This guy lived through Joseph Stalin's concentration camp. How many of you have ever read any of those books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn? You know what I'm talking about, man. You just, you can't quit. Just get one and read it, okay? You know, during World War II, Poland was attacked from both sides. Russia hit him from one side and Germany hit him from the other side. 
And the Polish army put up a ferocious resistance, but they were absolutely, hopelessly outnumbered, and they collapsed. Well, pretty soon they divided Poland up. Russia gets part, Germany gets part, and Russia had a bunch of prisoners. In 1992, the Russians finally admitted what happened to all the prisoners they took. They took 14,700 officers from the Polish army, tied their hands behind their back, and then jerked them up as hard as they could and wrapped the rope around their neck. But first they put a hood over their neck, over their head. Put a hood on their head, put the rope around the hood. Put them into railroad cars and took them out to the Katyn Forest and shot them in the back of the head. These are prisoners of war. You know what happened to the Geneva Convention? Hmm. 14,700 officers were murdered in cold blood. That's just in one forest. Why did they do this? Well, Joseph Stalin signed the order, and he said, well, these are Poles. They are inferior species. They haven't evolved as far as the Russians. I'm telling you, when a person starts believing in evolution, it might lead to this logical conclusion that, hey, maybe one race is superior to the others. Paul Pott, the communist dictator, was a strong believer in evolution. He executed about three million of his own people. He was the leader of the Khmer Rouge, and they're still causing trouble over there today, folks, setting landmines all over that country to blow up little kids as they walk to school. Well, how can you do that? Well, Pol Pot believed in evolution. He thought, you know, certain people are inferior. When the communists took over China, with American help, by the way, the communists killed about 60 million of their own people. 15,000 Christians a month were murdered. And during this time, the church in China grew like crazy. And did you know Chinese Christians are praying for persecution to come to America because it'll strengthen the church? They're worried the American church is weak. You need some persecution. That's what they're praying for. I just don't know if I want God to hear that prayer or not. See, when man thinks he's God, Satan deceives him into believing there is that he is God, you know. And communists have rejected God's authority and tried to put man in his place. Evolution is also the foundation for the Nazi movement. Adolf Hitler was a strong believer in evolution. Hitler's rise to power was financed by the Federal Reserve. We helped Hitler come to power over there. Dictator in Italy, Mussolini, was a strong believer in evolution. He thought the Italians were the superior species. Mussolini and Hitler, of course, in World War II, were allies for quite a while. Hitler thought the Germans were the superior race. And we covered on our video number four how that he had his list about that, you know, the Germans had evolved farther. A direct line runs from Darwin through the father of eugenics movement, Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, to the extermination camps of Nazi Europe. New Scientist magazine. Huh. Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, fascinating reading. I've only read about half of it. just makes me boil as I read this. How can anybody be so dumb as to believe this stuff? But Hitler thought the Germans were the superior race. And we covered earlier how that, you know, the Olympics were held in Germany in 1936, and the black man, Jesse Owens, beat the Germans. And Hitler was angry about it. He thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians were the superior race, and he thought the Jews were an inferior race. Hitler killed the Jews because of his belief in evolution. One of the guys who survived Hitler's camps, a Jewish doctor, said there is a difference between those who look upon their fellow human beings as common creatures of a common creator and those who look upon them as a conglomerate of biologicals and chemicals. You know, the Jewish Talmud, which is not the Old Testament, okay, that's the Torah. The Talmud says, teaches that non-Jews should be exterminated. According to the book uh, Yiboth, so how have you pronounce that, 98a, says all Gentile children are animals. This uh, rule 10 says even the best of the Gentiles should all be killed. If you want more on the Talmud, get a hold of uh, Michael Hoffman in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, hoffman-info.com, and see how dangerous that religion is. And somebody says, Hoban, are you anti-Semite? I don't even know what a Semite is. I'm pro-Israel. I think America should support Israel. I believe in Genesis chapter 12, those that bless you, will, you know, you'll be blessed. And we ought to support Israel. I'm not sure who these Semites are, but man, I think we ought, definitely ought to support Israel, okay? I've been to the Hitler concentration camps. I preached in Germany three times. You know, during World War II, there was a Polish salesman working for the IG Farben chemical company. 
that he sold cyanide, Zyklon B, and Malathion to the Nazis to help exterminate the Jews at Auschwitz. After the war, he thought, wow, I'm a war criminal, they're going to come after me. He feared for his life, so he joined the Catholic Church and became a priest. He hid in a convent for a while, or monastery, till things calmed down. Uh, at age uh, at 1958, he was ordained as Poland's youngest bishop. Thirty days later, the reigning pope was assassinated, and he became Pope John Paul II. Ooh. And by the way, the guy that wrote this book, Milton Cooper, was assassinated two months ago. But all you got to do is type in cyanide and pope on a website, and you'll get all sorts of documentation. This is exactly what happened, folks. Just better study that out, okay? What Hitler did to the Jews is because of his belief in evolution. And I wouldn't be loyal to any church just because mama went there, okay? I was raised Lutheran and Methodist and Mennonite, went to the Catholic Church, never joined. But folks, I'm going to stand for truth in what God's Word said, regardless of what anybody else thinks. And some of you better have the backbone to do the same. And if you're a Catholic, God loves you, okay? But you, you ought to get out of that mess. You better really study what you're in and get out of it, okay? Trust me. Hitler killed the Jews, though, because he thought they were an inferior species. And you're not going to understand World War II until you understand how evolution ties in. And we could talk a long time on this. I stood right there where Hitler made this speech a couple of years ago when I was over there in Nuremberg, Germany. Hitler had these massive rallies. He wanted the people to feel small and the cause to seem great. It was done intentionally. As I walked on these uh, blocks of stone there, I realized these blocks of stone were cut at the concentration camp I had just come from a few hours earlier, where thousands of Jews died cutting this granite so Hitler could walk on it, cutting and polishing granite stones. You know, the mentality of the environmental movement is the same today. They want the kids to feel small and the cause of saving the earth to feel great. Same mentality Hitler used. Hitler knew you have to reach the young people. I've had many people come to me and say, Brother Hovind, I was in Hitler's youth in Germany. And you are right. They bombarded us with evolution teaching in Hitler's youth corps. Ask anybody, if, I don't, maybe there's somebody here that was in Hitler's youth corps in Germany. They'll tell you that's what they taught them was evolution. Hitler kept calling the Jews a parasite in the body of nations. Same thing about the abortion issue, which we covered on video number four. Hitler said, this new state will give its youth to no one, but will instead take youth and give to youth its own education and its own upbringing. Your child belongs to us already. What are you? There was a man in Skokie, Illinois, that shot and killed a doctor. The police caught him. said, why did you kill that doctor? Here's what the man said. He told the authorities he chose a plastic surgeon from the phone book and killed him. Because they, the hairdressers and people who make blue-tinted contact lenses, are diluting the Aryan beauty. Folks, the Nazi movement is alive and well today, <laughs> including in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Am I right? Robin, do you get into any of this stuff? Okay. Hitler wanted to think, though. He wanted to hide behind the cross. There's a great book by Marvin Lutzer, president of Moody Bible Institute, about how Hitler tried to, he deceived the Christians. The Christians didn't oppose Hitler. For the longest time. Here's a propaganda picture Hitler used. He's walking out of a church with a cross over his head. Everybody thought, oh, what a great Christian he is. The guy was a heathen, okay? You know, they had Nazi baptisms and Nazi altars. Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. Um, the Japanese were taught that they had evolved farther and therefore were superior to all other races. The Japanese scientists produced studies decrying the apish, apish physical features of other races. He said the other races are more hairy. That proves they haven't evolved as far. You know, Japanese have very little hair, very little beard, okay? And the long arms of the Americans prove they're, you know, part ape. He noted the highly evolved characteristics of the Japanese, which included milder body odor. Time, Australia, 1995. The surprise attack on Pearl Harbor had many causes, but one major underlying factor to consider is the evolution-based thinking of the Japanese. They really thought they had evolved farther, and they really deserved to rule the world. 
And they were shocked when the Americans surrendered at Bataan in the Philippines. And they thought, oh, they're just, an, they're just animals. I mean, the Bataan Death March, it goes back to the philosophy the Japanese had about their superiority based on evolution. It's also the foundation of the New World Order. United Nations, the New World Order, a one world government, they want to establish a UN military force that can intervene in internal affairs of any country. They would like the UN to eliminate veto power held by the US. They would like to give the UN jurisdiction over Earth commons, the oceans, all minerals in the Earth's crust, the atmosphere, the airwaves, etc. You know, the Earth's already been divided up into 10 regions. Now, preacher, I don't know, but maybe we've missed something in Christianity, reading about in the end times when there's going to be 10 kingdoms give their power to one king, you know, in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Everybody's been thinking this is the European common market. And maybe it is, I don't know. But maybe these 10 kingdoms are actually the entire world divided up into 10 kingdoms. I don't know. I think we ought to consider that and study that a little farther. These guys are making serious plans to rule the world. And God is up in heaven laughing about it. The heathen rage. The people imagine a vain thing. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Hey, God sees what's going on, and he's laughing about it. But, you know, they want to give the United Nations the power to tax. Tax fishing on the oceans. Anything being emitted to the atmosphere. Folks, there's a real serious problem brewing on the horizon. So what should we do about it? We'll get to that in a second here. All right. Peter Singer said Christianity is our foe. If animal rights is to succeed, the, we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition. The United Nations would like to establish a new seat of power, the People's Assembly, to have representatives from non-government organizations, people that aren't elected, are going to make decisions about what happens to us. Hmm. They would like to create a new international court that will have jurisdiction over all nation-states. Might want to get in Caesar's grip. Uh, Congressman George Hansen said it's impossible to have religious freedom in any nation where churches are licensed to the government. If your church is government licensed, 501c3, and or incorporated as a nonprofit organization, that's exactly what it is. You know, the IRS acknowledges that churches are automatically tax exempt and tax deductible without applying for 501c3. Our ministry is not 501c3. As long as I'm alive, it won't be, okay? A senator from Nebraska in a radio debate said, You fundamentalist parents have no right to indoctrinate your children in your beliefs. We are preparing their children for the year 2000 in life in a global one world society, and those children will not fit in. Uh, he wants to prepare my children for something? Oh, now, wait a minute. Maybe that's why so many kids are uh, losing their faith. Folks, there's a concerted effort. While we're busy coming, singing songs, and preaching the gospel, and sending out missionaries, the atheists are just as busy, if not more busy, spreading their gospel via our school system. They're using our tax dollars to spread their religion. And we're sound asleep. Since 1963, when evolution became the state religion, all sorts of things have happened to our country. We covered this on videotape number one about what's happened in our country, how there's been a rise in sexually transmitted diseases, a rise in premarital sex, a rise in unwed birth rates, a decline in test scores. I mean, the, the thing goes on and on. What's happened in our country? Uh, unmarried couples living together, now 725% increase since early 60s. Divorce rates have gone crazy in this country. Our moral culture is... Our fabric is unraveling. Violent crimes increased nearly a thousand percent. SAT scores have plummeted. Kids are acting like animals. What should we do? Okay. The other philosophy of governments based upon creation. We get back to this idea that God created us. It'll start to straighten things out. Now, the bad guys who would like to have a one-world government have learned a simple technique. You create a crisis, and then the people will call for you to come solve the crisis. That's why Oklahoma City bombing took place. They wanted to get the anti-terrorist bill passed through Congress. You know, there's been, for three years, there's been an effort to get airport employees to be federal employees, right? It's really a federal takeover of the airports. 
I was standing on the sidewalk for four hours at the Atlanta airport when they shut down the Atlanta airport. I was in that crowd out there standing on the sidewalk. Okay. That bill to get federalization of the airports had been on hold for three years. While everybody's out on the sidewalk and the Atlanta airport shut down, which basically shuts down the world airport system, that bill passed. Interesting. Whenever there's a crisis like the Twin Towers getting blown up, you just better look behind the scenes and see what's really happening. Why is this going on? There's a reason for it, okay? It's all part of the plan. If you want to get some good books on this topic, I suggest you read The Medusa File. Excellent book dealing with government cover-ups. Uh, I believe you can order that through our ministry or get it through nidlink.com. Get the Conspiracy for Global uh, Control article in uh, this magazine, which is right here in Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin. You can get it from them. Um, there was a book written called The Protocols of Zion. Now, it was written by the rich guys, but they said if this book ever gets found, we want to blame it on the Jews. So they called it Protocols of Zion. But it's actually the plan of how to control the world. It's about 70-some pages. You can, I don't think you can print it off my website, but you can get it in a lot of places. And some people think, oh, Hoven, Hoven mentions the Protocols of Zion. That means he's anti-Jewish. <laughs> no, I'm not anti-Jewish. Okay? I love the Jews. But the Protocols of Zion was written to explain how to control the world. I mean, it lays it all out. But it's really carefully done so that if it's ever discovered, the Jews take the blame for it. Interesting. Well, read the book and see what you think. There's a committee of 300 people that make plans for how the world ought to be run. And they really have serious plans to control the world. Okay. What should we do about it? There's all these crises happening. We need to understand and need to try to see through some of this. For instance, Civil War was intentionally done. World War II was the Great Depression. All these things are planned ahead of time and they're orchestrated to get a particular cause, or to cause a particular response among the people. Churchill was brought into the visitor's gallery at the New York Stock Exchange to witness the stock market collapse in 1929, I believe. They said, watch, we're going to collapse the economy for you. Watch this. It's done intentionally, folks. The Cuban Missile Crisis was done intentionally. See, the Soviets wanted a military base in Cuba. So they brought in a military base and missiles. Two steps forward. And then Kennedy huffed and puffed, get those missiles out of there. Okay, okay, they took the missiles out, we think. They left the military base. Two steps forward, one step back. Pretty soon you reach the goal that way. Huh. Oklahoma City was bombed on purpose. There's a long story behind that. We put at the end of this tape the footage from the news media showing how there were more bombs found in the building. Hmm. Get to harvest-trust.org for more on that, or Ben Parton, Air Force explosives expert, there's his phone number, will tell you that building was not blown up by a truck bomb in the street. Okay? It was done to get anti-terrorism legislation passed. That's why the building was blown up. TWA 800 was purposely brought down intentionally, as was the World Trade Center. Uh, we could talk a long time on this one. Anyway, uh, let's see. Martial law, executive orders... I'll just flash these on the screen because you can study this from so many sources. A lot of folks have studied this uh, and put out good work. I want you to see how it ties in with evolution. Okay? Here are the folks that are involved in this new world order. The United Nations, of course, is a key player. The World Council of Churches, the CFR, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the IMF, that's the Inter International Monetary Fund, okay? the international bankers, the Club of Rome, the Communists, the Socialists, the National Education Association, NEA. By the way, if you're a public school teacher, you ought to get out of the NEA. You say, well, I'll lose my insurance. Well, then go without insurance, okay? I have for 13 years. Get out of that mess, okay? Don't give your money to that cause. There are other ways to get insurance, and you don't have to be a member of the NEA. If you love God, get out, okay? Cancel your subscription. The NOW organization, the UCL, uh, ACLU, the Masonic Lodge. You know, I don't think the average Mason knows what they're in, but they're in a satanic organization. Here's what the leader of the Masonic Lodge said, Albert Pike, 33rd degree. He said, that which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a God, but it's the God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign general inspectors, grand inspectors general, 
we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the highest degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. But yes, Lucifer is God. There aren't many Masons that realize they worship Lucifer. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly handle energy. Manley Hall, Lost Keys of Masonism, Ma Masonry. You want more on the Masonic Lodge? Get this book. Excellent book by uh, John Henry. It's not his real name, by the way. Or this one you can get from Chick Publications, Masonry. Beyond the Light, www.chick.com. They have lots of good books on the Masonic Lodge. My Bible says to swear not at all. Here's the Masonic oath that they swear. I, they put their name in here, do hereby swear that I will always conceal and never reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry to any person. If I do, I consent to having my throat cut from ear to ear, my tongue torn out by the roots, my body buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? My Bible says, above all things, swear not at all. February 2nd, the 33rd day of the year, which is the first uh, high day in satanic churches, that's when, 1933, Roosevelt passed the War Powers Act. Roosevelt ordered all private gold turned into the government, and Rockefeller helped set up Adolf Hitler in Germany in 1933. Two 33rd degree Masons, Laurel and Hardy, made a movie, Sons of the Desert, with all sorts of secret meanings in there. The occultist Vice President Henry Wallace, 1933, put the great seal on our $1 bill, which is a Masonic symbol. Universal Declaration of Human Rights was signed. The Humanist Manifesto was signed, 1933. Uh, Adam Weishaupt said, The most wonderful thing of all is that the distinguished Lutheran and Calvinist theologians who belong to our order really believe that they see in it, the Illuminati, the true and genuine sense of Christian religion. Oh, mortal man, is there anything you cannot be made to believe? A lot of Christians are deceived. There are many good books on this topic. If you want to read more on the New World Order, I recommend any of these on the screen here, including the drive toward a one-world church via new translations of the Bible. Get New Age Bible versions if you want more on that topic. Okay. In Revelation 2, he said, I know, you're, I know you live where Satan's seat is. But you know, the satanic symbol for years has been the upside-down five-pointed star representing the goat's head. Very few folks realize this five-pointed upside-down star is symbolized, is symbolism is used all over the world. Did you know Washington, D.C. was laid out to be a upside-down five-pointed star centering on the Capitol and the White House? Huh, interesting. The world is a mess. Satan wants his one world government. Christians are going to be squeezed out. We're going to see a mark of the beast coming soon. It's a mess. What should we do? Okay. What we need are men and women of understanding to know what to do. In Proverbs, it says, A man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. In Deuteronomy, we were told, Take you wise men and understanding. We need some people of understanding. In 1 Kings, he prayed, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. The Bible says Abigail was a woman of good understanding and beautiful countenance. That doesn't hurt, okay? Um, Ezra chapter 8, he said uh, there were chief men, men of understanding. Eight different times, or five different times in chapter 8, it talks about men of understanding. Men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. If anything, we need some pastors with understanding to understand the situation and to know what they ought to do to lead their people because troublous times are coming. Folks, it is time to get motivated. Not the time, like, like that song, you know, when the house is burning to the ground, it's not the time to stand around arranging all the pictures on the wall. Find something to do. Here's what I recommend you do. Number one, you need to realize God's in control. Don't get nervous. Get busy, okay? He's the potter. We're the clay. Let him do something with you. Look, this is his world. 
He can do with it as he pleases. We're just his servants. Do what he says. He promised he will finish the work. The devil thinks he will usurp God's kingdom. He's in for a surprise. Okay. Um, number two, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Number three, be careful. That means full of care for nothing. Don't get so worried about things on this earth. It's not going to matter. Number four, pray for those in authority. We were commanded to do that in 1 Timothy, to pray for those in authority. We are his children, so we need to preach the gospel. Just obey his orders, okay? We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Salt flavors. Salt irritates. If nobody's irritated at you, you're not a good Christian. You don't have to try to irritate anybody. You just try to be salty. That will irritate them, okay? You need to use your influence on school boards, politics. I think Christians should be very involved in influencing their community. People say Christians shouldn't get in politics. Oh, tell that to King David and King Solomon, huh? Okay. I think you ought to use the creation method as a means of evangelism like they did in Acts chapter 17. Paul on Mars Hill said, The unknown God that you ignorantly worship, here's the one I want to talk to you about, God the creator of the universe. Read Acts 17 and see how he never quoted one verse. He used creation as a means of evangelism. Kids in your town tomorrow are going to be taught evolution. Here's a chapter summary. Life arose from non-living matter present on early earth. That's an insult to God's word, isn't it? That ought to bother somebody. Kids are being taught that uh, we got here by a process called evolution. And you are paying to have them taught this stuff. Number six, don't get distracted. You know, we get distracted so easily. You ever seen a mobile that you put over the top of the baby's crib? You wind it up, you know, and the kid lays there and goes, oh. He gets distracted. Satan is a master at distracting God's children. Did you know the average American watches 1,500 hours of TV a year? That's enough time to read your Bible 22 times cover to cover. I don't think you ought to sit around and read your Bible all day every day, but you ought to read it some. Psalm 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Hey, suppose you made a rule around your house. If something wicked comes on TV, you shut it off for two hours. If you see someone immodestly dressed, you shut it off. If you see someone drinking alcohol, if you, see, if you hear a curse word, you shut it off for two hours. How much would you watch? Well, then uh, read that verse and explain to me, huh? The Bible says, for the transgressions of the land, many are the princes thereof. You know, we got a lot of bureaucrats in this country because we deserve it. We're wicked. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Solomon was told by the Lord, hey, you want revival? If my people, God said, which are called by my name, shall vote Republican and join the militia. No, that's not what he said, is it? Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven forgive their sin, and heal their land. You know, David's older brother was in the battle against Goliath. Everybody was afraid to fight Goliath, but little David showed up with the cheese and the raisins, and David's older brother said, what are you doing here? Why don't you go home and take care of the sheep? Little David said something fascinating, to me anyway. Little David said, is there not a cause? Hey, question, what is your cause? What are you anxious to do this week? or this month, or this year? What's your cause? My cause is to take the creation message to everybody, to get people saved, and if they're saved, I want to get them fired up to do something for God with their life. That's my cause. I live for that. I wake up in the middle of the night and get ideas to put in my presentation. I live to spread the creation message. I want to preach to everybody in the world. Thoreau said there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who's striking at the root. I want to go right to the root of the problem. The, root, the problem's not abortion. The problem's evolution. The problem's not communism. The problem's evolution. It's a philosophy, a rejection of God. That's where the problem is. Hey, is this your cause? 
You can't wait to find out who won the stupid bowl. Oh. Is, is this your cause? A ball? Or a hockey puck? I mean, is this where your time and energy and money goes? The Bible says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. You know, people that uh, watch a lot of football on TV, you know what they want? They want to watch more. People that have a million dollars, you know what they want? More. People that have a thousand pairs of shoes in their closet, you know what they want? More shoes. People that have a big house, you know what they want? Bigger, Bigger house. Mm -hmm. People that have 75 acres, uh, you know what they want? A hundred. People that have a fast car, you know what they want? A faster car. Nothing in this earth is going to satisfy. You might as well figure it out. Okay? It's not going to satisfy. Did you know, if you spend 500 bucks, you can buy a real nice set of golf clubs. And then if you're willing to practice for thousands of hours, you got to really be dedicated. You have to dedicate yourself and practice and practice. Get the grip just right. You know, shoulders bent, knees slightly bent, club face perpendicular to the ball, V-shaped grip, fingers laced. Bend the right elbow first. If you practice for thousands of hours, someday you will be able to knock a ball into a hole in the dirt. And the angels rejoiced. <laughs> hey, if you're a Christian, seek those things that are above. Folks, we're going to lose it all here. It's all going to burn. Okay? Set your affection on things above. Love not the world. The lust of the world, the pride of life. The Bible has a lot to say about that. This world's going to pass away. And number seven, listen for the trumpet. The Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Southern Baptists go first, and then we get to go right after that. Okay? <laughs> listen for the trumpet, folks. We're going to be caught up together with the Lord to meet the Lord in the air. Get ready for that day. And lastly, win souls. He that winneth souls is wise. You know, during the Civil War, which was not the Civil War, by the way, it's Abe Lincoln's war. That's another long story. But uh, this big old country boy signed up to go fight the Yankees. He's from Alabama. He'd been, you know, working on the field, toting hay, and he wanted to go fight the Yankees. So he went off to boot camp and got his training and got his rifle, got his backpack, and showed up at the battlefield, said, reporting to duty, sir. Sergeant said, man, are we glad you're here, son. We need recruits bad. Son, your job is to guard the trench right here. The Yanks are over there. We're here. You just march back and forth from here to that tree and come back and uh, you guard the trench. He said, Sarge, I didn't come to guard no trench. I come to fight the Yanks. And they're right over there. Can I please go fight them? He said, no, son, you don't understand. We're waiting for orders. We're dug in and they're dug in. Nobody's moved for six weeks. Just stay here, son. So the big old country boys marching back and forth in the mud, you know, getting madder by the minute. He said, I didn't come to march in the mud. I come to fight the Yanks and they're right over there. Why can't I go fight them? You know, he's walking back and forth. Finally, he just couldn't take it anymore. He dropped everything, jumped up out of the trench, and ran, screaming across no man's land all by himself. A one-man rebel charge. The Yanks were stunned. Now, what's this guy doing, trying to commit suicide or something? The guy ran all the way across the no man's land, jumped into the Yankee trench, picked up the first Yankee he saw, and boom, knocked him out. One punch. Grabbed his prisoner, climbed up out of the trench, and ran back for the rebel trench. Everybody was stunned. Nobody dared shoot now. He jumped back into the rebel trench, holding his prisoner. All the rebs gathered around and said, what? What is that? He said, that's a Yankee. They said, well, yeah, we know. Uh, where did you get him? He said, I got him over yonder. He said, there's a whole bunch more over there. He said, you all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. Hey, you know what, folks? Suppose we all died tonight and we all went to heaven. We're going to find that some people have a crowd gathered around them that they influenced for God. And some of you are going to have nobody with you. You've never led anybody to Christ, have you? You've never brought anybody to church. Oh, you're saved. 
But that's where it stopped somehow. He forgot the rest of the Great Commission. And you're going to walk up to one of those folks with a crowd around them and say, where did you get all of them? They're going to say, I got them down yonder on the earth. Y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. When I was 16 years old, I got saved. And I don't know, I got a double dose or something, but I really got excited. I was reading my Bible and going to church, and I just, I really was eating it up. After about three months, one of my friends said, Hey, Ken, how'd you like to go to the Heart of Illinois Fair? They've got a, a carnival, the fair there, you know, and uh, we're going to set up a booth with Campus Life, and we're going to give out gospel tracts and try to get people saved. I said, I've never led anybody to Christ. I don't know how to do it. I've only been saved a couple of months myself. And he said, don't worry about it. You don't, need to, you don't need to witness to anybody. Your job is to show up at the carnival and pass out these uh, flyers, which have uh, ten questions. Okay, Try to get the people to answer the questions. The last question says, would you like to get to know God better? If they say yes, then say, okay, come with me. Bring them to the tent at the back. Open up the flap and say to us, hey, this is George or whatever. He would like to get to know God better. So I was out there for three days. I was having a blast, man. For first two days anyway, I was getting people to fill out this questionnaire. If they said they wanted to get to know God better, I would say, hey, come with me. And we'd go to the back, and I'd say, George, this is Herman. He wants to know how to get to know God. Go on in there, Herman. And they would lead him to Christ. Third day, third night, I'm out there, Heart of Illinois Fair, Peoria, Illinois, filling out my questionnaires. I talked to this big old football player from Richwoods High School, our arch enemy, by the way, back then. I went to East Peoria. Big old football player. I said, uh, hey, would you fill out this questionnaire? He said, yeah, sure. He's answering the questions. And last question. Would you like to get to know God better? He said, yeah, I sure would. I said, come with me. I'd done this before. You know, I'm getting to be a pro by now. We walked to the back of the tent. I opened up the flap. There was nobody there. I later found out where they were. Very interesting. There were two guys at the fair that were Siamese twins, you know, stuck together, Lonnie and Donnie. They couldn't separate them because they only had one heart. So they were like in their late teens or early 20s, I don't remember now. But a couple of the soul winners had gone down and witnessed to these guys, and Donnie got saved. Lonnie didn't. Siamese twins. Well, the next night, they decided to go down there and disciple Donnie, and so they were talking about the rapture. Well, his brother Lonnie is sitting right there. You know. <laughs> he said, now, wait a minute. You mean if the Lord comes back and that trumpet blows, my brother's going to take off and I'm still here? Yeah, that's right. He said, we only have one heart. What's going to happen to me? Oh, man, I don't know. You're going to have a problem, aren't you? He said, well, I better get saved, haven't I? Yeah, you better get saved. <laughs> I didn't know all that that day. All I knew was I'm standing here with this football player and there's nobody in the back of the tent, okay? And the football player says, what do we do now? I said, well, uh, I guess I'll show you. I'd never led anybody to Christ in my life. I didn't know how to do it. We went and sat down in the metal chairs in the dirt in the tent in the heart of Illinois Fair. I didn't know what to do. So I got a tract out of my pocket. It was God's Four Spiritual Laws. I opened it up and read it to him. I didn't know what else to do. You know, read him. Law number one, you know, you're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell, etc., etc. I got to the end, and it said, uh, I'm just reading the whole thing to him, sitting beside him. At the end, it says, if you'd like to receive Christ, pray this prayer. I said, would you like to receive Christ? He said, yeah, I would. I thought, oh, brother, what do I do now? I said, well, let's just say the prayer this prayer. So I'll tell you what. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads and let's pray. And I'll pray first and you repeat what I say. I didn't know what else to do. Okay. So we closed our eyes. I kept one eye open. I read the prayer off the track. And he repeated after me and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. When we got done, he looked at me and he said, man, thank you. I've been worried about this for a couple of weeks. Thank you for showing me how to go to heaven. This is great. And he walked out the tent. Never saw him again. But I was all by myself. A lot of noise outside the carnival going on, you know, the lights and everything else. I just got down in the dirt by that metal chair. 
I said, Lord, it's me, it's Kent. I said, Lord, I'm only 16. I don't know what you want for my life. I don't have a clue, Father. But Lord, if it's okay with you, I think I'd like to do this the rest of my life. I'd like to bring people to Jesus. Well, folks, it's been uh, 33 years next month. And guess what? I, sh I still just want to bring people to Jesus, that's all. I don't know what you want. Maybe it's more money. Maybe it's a bigger house. Maybe it's a faster car. I don't know what you're living for. But uh, would you like to really, really do something exciting in this life? I mean, something like you can't imagine. It is so awesome. You ought to dedicate your life to bringing people to Jesus. There's nothing like it in the world. And some of you have never done it. Well, get busy. If you can't get you a big one, get you a little one. But go get somebody and show them how to go to heaven. Give them a gospel track. Invite them to church. You say, I don't want to drive them off. What are you going to drive them off to? Hell number two? <laughs> Folks, don't get nervous about this New World Order stuff. I read the last chapter. We win. This is the time. If there ever was a time in the history of the world, this is it. To forget the cares of the world and reach others for Christ. What are you doing? If you're not sure you're saved, first of all, you better get saved. If you are saved, then you better find something to do for the Lord with your life. We hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6.23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. There was a white pickup truck backing a trailer into the scene here. They're trying to move people out of the way so they can get it in. Appears to be the Oklahoma County Bomb Squad. Uh, it's their bomb disposal unit, essentially, is what it is. And it is what they would use to, if, if the report that we gave you just a few moments ago turns out to be correct, that they have found a second explosive device of some kind inside this building. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in. And they will use that, uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with it.
If you are uh, outside the metro area, you'd have to be well outside the metro area if you did not feel the blast that uh, occurred. This was just, this a, few was just a few moments ago. People running uh, north away from the federal confirmed uh, through federal authorities that a second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. It was an explosion at 9 o'clock this morning that did that damage you're looking at right there, blowing off the entire north face of that building. Again, you're looking at the north face there, a second bomb was found on the east side of that building. A bomb squad is on the scene. That second bomb has not exploded. We don't know quite the status yet if they've managed to defuse it, but it has been confirmed that a second bomb was found on the east side of that building. And it... Dave Baloo here joining me. Dave, what do you have to add? Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Morrow building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. Still a lot of activity around the Morrow building. Uh, security concerns that another one still might go off. That's what everybody's worried about. That's the reason they have moved the media. Everyone's back up. Right, let's take a look now, if we could. I understand we just received videotape then. A news conference held just a few moments ago at St. Anthony's Hospital. Okay. Tom Coniglione, he's medical director of, uh, of St. Anthony Hospital. This is Jim Maravich. He is uh, chief operating officer and executive vice president of the hospital. I'll give you their cards after the uh, conference is over so you'll know the spelling. Uh, the situation at the present time is that we have treated uh, more than 56 injuries. Uh, there have been several more since last count. Um, at the present time, the medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. I've been told by the police department that just as soon as those bombs are defused, they will permit the medical teams to enter. And once the medical teams enter, we expect quite a large number of rather badly injured individuals being brought here. Tell us exactly where you were when the explosion hit. I was in the uh, city courts building, which is uh, just about two blocks south and one block west of the uh, federal building. And, and it was amazing that people walked down in the street and we looked in that direction and several people said, well, it looks like that's the federal building. Uh, somebody's bombed the federal building. Somebody's bombed the federal courthouse, which was right across the street. Um, because really, there was nothing else that would explain this kind of force. That's what came to everyone's mind, mm -hmm. was that it must be some type of explosive. Yeah, Mike, hang, hang with us just for a second. We want to update our audience that uh, the Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Mora uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I, and I might tell you, in addition to that, that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. So a total of three. A total saying. of three. And, of course, then there was mass confusion whenever uh, there were hundreds of spectators in the area. And when they heard that there were other bombs in the building, people were running from the area in the opposite direction as fast as they could, trying to evacuate again. And you see the utter devastation that that one explosion caused. Because here's now what we are starting to learn about uh, the succession, or what someone obviously hoped would be a succession of explosions. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go up. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. So try to imagine two yeah. or three-fold happening mm -hmm. uh, what we've already seen there. It is just uh, incredible to think that there was that much heavy artillery that was somehow moved into the downtown Oklahoma City Federal Building. And you're looking at, obviously, aerial pictures from Chopper 4. They kept us out for a while because of obvious reasons, and we respect their demands on that. We are now there with our camera and our chopper, and it gives you a bird's-eye view of the devastation again one more time on this because we've been hoping this wouldn't be the case, but it is the case. Six of the dead are children, two are adults from this explosion today. There was a daycare inside the building. And uh, imagine the callousness of setting off a bomb where children are inside. It's mind-boggling. The daycare was on the second floor, so we would assume that as they were starting to get uh, through their 
uh, early evacuation and rescue efforts before being called back because of the, uh, the concern over the other explosive devices. Uh, that perhaps uh, the daycare area is one that they were able to get to. <laughs> And this is the point now where the evacuations began again, and you can see everybody starting to leave downtown for fear that the exact same thing was about to happen again. Fortunately, it didn't, because the second device that they found, we understand, was even more powerful than the first. They then found a third device, and you can see the look on this woman's face at the fear that she might have to go through the same thing again. They then found a third device, which was also larger than the first. Uh, hard to feel lucky at this point, but certainly through uh, some good work by some munitions experts and the uh, explosive sniffing dogs, further tragedy has almost certainly been averted here uh, today. The reports I have is that one device was uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. So President Clinton just called Frank uh, Keating, Governor Frank Keating, and he says that three FBI anti-terrorist teams are en route to Oklahoma City. Right now, they are saying that this is the work of a sophisticated group. This is a very uh, sophisticated uh, device, and um, it has to have been done by an explosive expert, um, obviously with this type of explosion. So we're getting word now that President Clinton is sending anti-terrorism units down here mm -hmm. to, to look over the situation to find out exactly what went on and what other danger may be out there in Oklahoma City. That's something we need to think about, unfortunately, this time, because, as we've told you, two other explosive devices were found that were not detonated, and they were larger. We've told you on a couple of occasions now, they are really only just now beginning, thanks to the big, uh, I guess it was about an hour and a half delay or so, uh, while they were second, worried about the second and no. third devices that they had found, uh, they are really only now starting to uh, really get full force into the rescue and search operation going all through all nine floors of the building uh, that are above ground, four floors of parking garages that are below. You talk about uh, the second bomb that was found. Uh, Devin told us earlier we got information that the second and third bomb were bigger than the one that was detonated, 1,200 pounds of explosives in that first one that went off. The second and third devices that were found were actually larger than that, so you can imagine what that would have been like. Can you tell me, they, they had the found the, the bomb squad is there, west corner of the Murrah building. Is that correct? Another bomb inside the Murrah building. Supposedly there may be another device there. There may be another device there, and they are evacuating the area. And we'll okay. reiterate again what these uh, later devices are doing to the rescue effort. Time is so valuable right now as they try to get to these people who uh, perhaps uh, somehow are still hanging on uh, to life inside that building and each delay every time the firefighters and the rescuers are caught to are, are called back and brought back down off of their ladders and scaffoldings uh, just could be exacting a terrible terrible toll on the people who are already inside yes it is and we talked earlier about the two undetonated bombs that were found that were bigger than the device that exploded and if this other one that they're looking at now turns out to be something of the peers that it was meant for this building to come down, to be leveled, because of the uh, amount of power that could have gone off. Only one explosion, it was obviously tragic enough, but there were more bombs set to go off, according to ATF officials. It's been about five hours now since that first explosion occurred, almost five hours exactly. Uh, you probably, if you were in bed at the time that it uh, rattled you around, you looked at the alarm clock, you'll remember the time, and you will certainly now remember April 19th, 1995. But five hours since, and uh, because of these renewed concerns about new devices, five hours in, they are still really not able to get the uh, rescue effort into full swing. I've been listening to Mike McCurry, uh, President Clinton's spokesperson at the White House. Apparently at this point we know a little bit more than yeah. the White House does because we have been able to confirm that it was a car explosion. Uh, that word coming to us from Mayor Ron Norick earlier, 1,200 pounds of explosives parked out in front of the federal building. And ATF has confirmed that as well. Devin, we're getting more word on that car bomb now. Let us read this straight from the wire. You talked about it a minute ago. The head of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms now says it appears it was a car bomb with as much as 1,200 pounds of explosives packed inside. 1,200 pounds of explosives packed inside that car bomb in front of the federal building. We heard earlier off the wire that from the governor that 
some of the fatalities were outside and across the street from the building. Now it all makes sense because the bomb was parked outside in a car. Heather is with us. He's a terrorism expert. Doctor, we are just shocked that this would happen here in the heartland of America. Should we be shocked about a car bomb in Oklahoma City? Well, any place you have a federal building, uh, you have a target. That's the question everybody has right now. Why here? Why Oklahoma City? And and uh, you find out by finding why that building. I don't think it's I don't think it's material that it was in Oklahoma City. It's really the building. The building could have been in any city in the United States. The question is why that building? And was it Waco? Uh, is it uh, Nation of Islam? We should find out an awful lot. Uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. As you're mentioning it, it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City, but it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got defused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. Chip identification devices implanted into their bodies. Yes, you heard us right. Implanted into their bodies, just like in the science fiction movies. The chip will be implanted with and imprinted with personal information about them, data about their medical histories, their identification. And joining us now from Miami are Leslie, Jeffrey, and Derek Jacobs. And we welcome the Jacobs and also Keith Bolton, Chief Technology Officer of Applied Digital Solutions, the manufacturer of what is called the Verit chip. So let me start with you, Leslie, if I can, Leslie Jacobs. Your son, Derek, I understand, comes to you, he being a computer genius, and says, we have to do this. Did you think this is, was crazy at first? Um, at first, uh, I was skeptical, but um, I, looked about, uh, I looked at all the wonderful things that the Barrett chip can do. And as a parent, it uh, gives me peace of mind knowing that the Barrett chip is with me at all times and can... Um, basically give valuable medical information. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family, and you never know when an accident is going to happen, and the Vera chip can um, give that medical information uh, instantaneously and be able to save my life. Well, my Jeff, I was going to say that, Jeffrey, this has special meaning for you, right, medical information? Um, it, it does, and because of my medical history being a very complicated one, uh, from the time that I had uh, cancer over a long period of time to all of the uh, problems which occurred as a result of the treatments and the disease itself, this can help save my life in case of an emergency because it has the information to be able to contact Leslie or, or my doctors uh, immediately in, in case of such a situation. All right, I want to go then to Keith to show us what this is, how it will be implanted, and where. Keith, show us first of all the chip itself. Okay, Diane, this is the chip right here. It's uh, 11 meter, millimeters by 2.1 millimeters, about the size of a piece of rice. And where were you implanted? What part of the body? Uh, the uh, chip itself uh, is implanted in the arm. And then how is it read? It's read with this proprietary scanner right here. And it's a very quick reading just over the body. And it produces information on the LED screen that is valuable that could save a person's life. So you have to have find somebody who has a scanner, right? Well, we are working with medical manufacturers of embedded medical devices, as well as uh, working with uh, medical service uh, ambulance companies uh, to adopt this as a, a particular reader and a standard. So let me ask you, Derek, what are your friends saying about this? At first, they really didn't understand it. But after I explained it, they thought it was really cool and that it could really help people in their everyday lives. You're not worried that it'll seem a little weird? <laughs> No, I'm not really worried. <laughs> well, I know you love computers and you love this adventure, and it could take place now, Keith, in about three weeks, right, with FDA approval. Do you know that there'll be no rejection, no problem? We anticipate to have the uh, protocol pilot testing in approximately three to four 
weeks, ready to begin. Uh, we do have the chip uh, embedded in one of our doctors on our medical staff, and it has been inside of his body uh, for approximately three to four months now. No rejection, no infection, and uh, no movement of the chip whatsoever. Leslie, a final question to you if I can. I know they're still working on the technology for a kind of global positioning chip, you know, where mm -hmm. you could be read by satellite where you are. Would your family do that too? Um. I think we, we definitely would consider doing that. Again, it's only activated if uh, we need this technology. If my son was kidnapped or I was kidnapped or something happened medically with my husband that he wandered off and, you know, became unconscious. So, yes, we would definitely consider that. Well, again, the Jacobs are leading us, as we said, into this new frontier. Check back in with us, will you, when you get it implanted? Yes, we sure. will. Sure. All Pleasure. right. And thank you, all of you, for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.